just uh, very briefly say hello, welcome. We have uh, kind of a tight packed agenda. Welcome to our first and I sincerely hope our only Zoom uh, annual research day, uh, which was canceled last year due to the first wave of the COVID epidemic at a time when we thought that we would you know, quickly get back on track by June or July. And we're still hoping by June or July, it just turns out to be a year later. In any event, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you to our speakers for agreeing to come and join us virtually. Uh, maybe Danielle, AKA Lysandra, um, you can just show the agenda briefly. I'll just make a couple of comments on the agenda. Um, so again, we have some opening remarks. Then our two keynote speakers, Minnie Gray and Penny. Um, and then we have some oral presentations. These are the six best selected uh, from many that were submitted. Uh, these will be judged by our online judges. And Danielle or Lysandra, you can tell me whether we now have confirmation from our judges because we had a little trouble. Um, yeah, Say what? We do have one confirmed, yes. We do have one confirmed, I think we're looking Only one confirmed. So what I would like is for people to send me a message in chat. Um, actually, one thing I could mention is that for everybody to mute themselves, unless you're talking, so we don't get all the background noise coming in. Okay, Carol and Pam, I'm guessing you're not muted. Can you mute them? Can the host mute them? Um, ah, there we go. That's one thing about Zoom, it highlights the name of the person who's apparently speaking. So then we, anyway, thank you, Carolyn. Um, so just to go on, so yes, try to remember to mute yourself uh, unless you're actually speaking or you're in a remarkably soundproof room. Um, feel free to keep the visual on so we can see that you're attentively listening to every word that's said. We do need a couple of judges for the oral presentations. Um, uh, just we've had some late last minute conflicts uh, in terms of scheduling. So if any of those at the investigators could volunteer to be judges, just send us a chat. We'll send you the grid. This is obviously for 2.30 to 3.30, but we wanted to get that organized. And more judges, the mirror, merrier. <laughs> and then we'll have some remarks from uh, Robin Waite, who's with Results Canada. And finally, I'll finish off um, I'll finish off with a few remarks, but also with the winners of our various publication awards, including from last year when the meeting was canceled, we had actually picked some winners uh, from this year and the uh, oral presentation winners. All that can happen very fast because there's no coming to the podium for pictures and a handshake. There's just, uh, you can wave, I guess, when your name's announced. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn, thanks, uh, Danielle, we'll stop that. Um, so um, I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Miguel Bernier to say a few words. Dr. Bernier is the interim executive director and CSO of the Research Institute. He's been the director of training and development and he's a professor of no less than four, in four no, sorry, five departments, ophthalmology, pathology, oncology, medicine, and surgery. So Dr. Bernier will give a quick uh, opening remarks. Uh, thanks, Miguel, over to you. Can you guys hear me well? Thank you very much, Dick, and uh, gives me a great deal of pleasure to participate in the opening remarks of this great day. I'm thrilled to see all of you from the McGill International TB Center, which is a PHO and WHO collaborative center for TB research. Certainly this center is such a highlight of our university and research institute. The world leader in the interdisciplinary study of TB, the center has, as we all know, more than 25 investigators and more than 75 trainees, numerous collaborations with groups all over the world. And I think working together um, to see 
the research and the clinical work for patients with TB around the world is just remarkable. I'd like to thank the organizers of this wonderful event for inviting me. First of all, my good friend, Dick Menzies, the director, and the associate directors, Dr. Pai, Dr. Oxlade, Dr. Divahani, and Dr. Khan, as well as Lisandra Lanes and her team for having organizing and coordinating and planning this event. The uh, exceptional scientific program with a great range of interesting and relevant issues on TB. This team is great because they all collaborated with centers around the world and they partnered together. And apparently the objective is to end tuberculosis by 2030, which is a very, very uh, exceptional objective. Um, as we navigated the COVID-19 pandemic, it's so important to pay attention to other infections, diseases, particularly TB. COVID-19 has definitely had increased complications for patients with TB. And I hope that the pandemic has taught us the importance of generosity, solidarity, and particularly in TB that affects largely less fortunate populations. I think it's important to emphasize the quality, the diversity, and the inclusion that should permeate our lives and to make sure that the resources and attention of patients with TB are given to everyone despite of socioeconomic differences. I always say that we don't do research as an intellectual exercise. We do research because there's a patient at the end of the day. And this research day and your research team is the perfect example of that working together to ensure our community and communities around the world can live TB free. Caring for our patients is the best way possible and the most important part of our work as physicians and researchers. Thank you very much again for having me here. What an honor and a privilege. Great, thank you, thank you Miguel. Um, it's uh, my, my words, I'll, I'll now ask uh, Dave. Dave uh, so Dave Eidelman, sorry, Dr. Eidelman is the um, uh, Vice Principal Health Affairs, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. So Dave, if you can just say a few words for us. Well, like Miguel, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. I, when I was asked uh, to, to, to say a few words, I, you know, I get asked a lot and uh, I usually say yes, but here I, I was keen to say yes, uh, because uh, we have very few units that have distinguished themselves as, as much as the International TB Center has uh, in terms of its international reputation and its impact. Um, it's certainly one of the best uh, such units in the world. Uh, according to my notes, it says you're ranked in the top five. But I, 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 I'm putting aside the, the, the specific details of the ranking. I think the, the, the real achievement uh, of bringing together uh, a group of uh, outstanding researchers to uh, build a program that uh, is not only uh, attracting international reputation, but is also having major impact and translating into results that are meaningful in terms of the treatment of patients, I think is an enormous achievement. And I, I want to particularly salute you, Dick, because I remember when you came as a resident, uh, a pulmonary resident from Lesotho, uh, you had been in Lesotho, and, and I know that this is, uh, uh, when your uh, passion for TB was, uh, was uh, I guess, got its initiation, and you've worked tirelessly, and uh, I might say relentlessly, to build up uh, this program and done so with enormous success. And it's, it's, it's much overdue. Uh, TB, you know, I, I spent much, most of my career as a practicing lung doctor and I, I was peripherally involved in TB, but it was clear that among major infectious diseases, tuberculosis has been neglected. Uh, there's been a relatively little progress uh, despite Dick's and your, the rest of the crew's hard work. Uh, we don't have an effective vaccine that was invented in, in, in the last, you know, it's 100 years old. Uh, latent TB test is from 1908, it says here in my notes. And of course, the anti-TB chemotherapy is, there's been progress, but boy, it, it, it pales by comparison to a lot of other infectious diseases where much more has been done. And Madhu Pai constantly sends me emails about how it's, it's time to treat TB as importantly as we treated COVID-19. And I think I think he's right in terms of the burden of disease on, on the world. <clears throat> so I, I really feel that this unit 
uh, has, has, has allowed McGill and the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences to have a profile that's both um, intellectually and scientifically important, but also uh, important from a social accountability point of view and uh, making a difference for people uh, here, but also uh, uh, around, the, uh, around the world. And uh, it's great to see the enormous engagement of the faculty members, but also of the students and the staff. And I think you're off to a fantastic, uh, a fantastic research day, which unfortunately I won't be able to attend, even though I probably should to, to, to learn something about TB. But I wish you guys a great day. Keep up the great work. And thank you for inviting me to be a, a part of it, even a small bit of it. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. Yes, I know that uh, Madhu has been particularly tireless in pointing out that, you know, in one year we've gone from just learning about COVID to having multiple vaccines of, you know, variable efficacy perhaps, uh, but certainly most of them highly effective comparing that to uh, TB where we have one vaccine that was introduced in 1923 and we still don't really have a good second vaccine, although, of course, there's promise, and Penny's going to talk to us about some of that promise. Um, so there is some work, but definitely with COVID, much more was achieved in one year than in a century of work in TB. So clearly, uh, you know, the, the resources, human and other resources poured into COVID, even a fraction of that was diverted or ultimately transformed into TB when COVID hopefully is uh, a thing of the past. I think we'll make great strides, but thank you, Dave, and thank you, Miguel. Okay, so um, we're actually a little ahead. The, the, the welcoming remarks ended uh, in a timely fashion. Thanks, <laughs> um, for which we're not, uh, for which we're grateful. But um, is Minnie there? Because we're slightly in advance of. I'm here, but I'm no. I'm. I'm. My screen is uh, Yuan Girard. Oh, okay, I wondered who that. I uh, we we've been instructed by the ministry not to use Zoom anymore, but we kept a couple of licenses, and one of them happens to be in the name of Yuan, so I connected with his license. Okay, great. Okay, Yuan. Okay, we're having these identity issues that we were talking about before. <laughs> so sorry, Minnie. I should have recognized you. I just I kind of glanced past. All right, great. Thank you, Minnie. I'm glad you're here. And welcome. So I'm going to ask Faz actually to formally introduce you uh, for our first uh, keynote lecture. I can just mention that Minnie had was invited and had accepted to come give the keynote lecture last year, but unfortunately last year, as I said, was cancelled due to COVID. So very kindly, she's agreed to come and and uh, give the give the keynote this year. So Faz, over to you if I can. Sure, hi, I uh, just want to check if everyone can hear me okay. Great, um, thanks Dick. Uh, for many years, Minnie Gray has dedicated herself towards fostering Inuit well-being within Nunavik, in Canada and around the globe. Uh, she was born in Kengiuksuk, a small community situated a few kilometers upstream from Angaba Bay. And her record working for Nunavik Inuit is really expansive. She acted as a negotiator for Nunavik self-government. Uh, she was a member of the Makovic Corporation, the official organization representing the interests of Nunavik Inuit. Since 2013, she has been the executive director of the Nunavik Regional Board of Health and Social Services. And she's also co-chair of the Nunavik Initiative SACUK to address and reconstruct social regulation. Uh, Ms. Gray's national and international involvement includes a past position as Vice President of the Canadian Office of the Inuit Circumpolar Council and membership in several international and United Nations committees. She's currently Chair of the Circumpolar Inuit Health Steering Committee uh, for the Inuit Circumpolar Council. And all these commitments have earned Mimi Gray many awards, including the Public Service Award for Excellence from the National Aboriginal Achievement Foundation and the Jubilee Medal. She is a companion of the Alb National du Québec, recipient of the Charter of Quebec Human Rights 40th Anniversary Award, and became a member of the Order of Canada in 2018. Uh, Minnie Gray, we are truly honored to have you open McGill's eighth annual TV Research Day. 
Thank you, Fass. You almost made me cry. <laughs> um, I think Lysandra is supposed to show my PowerPoint. If she could do that, I would really appreciate it. Lysandra? Okay, screen sharing. Um, I don't see, I don't see the... Minnie, do you see it? We see, at least I see the eliminated... Oh yeah, I, it's here now. Okay. We have slow internet here. Ah. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to turn off my video because uh, it helps with the uh, bandwidth here. So, um, Thank you very much for inviting me to this. I mean, the invitation came last year. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I can hear you very well. Okay. So, yeah. um, thanks for the invitation, which was, yeah, as mentioned, I was supposed to be there in person, but uh, this is, uh, this is a, a great way to, to join each other. Uh, this is how we do things now since the, the pandemic started. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my presentation is quite long, so I hope I'm not going to bore you to death. Um, but um, I, I want to thank my uh, my team here that have put this exceptional uh, presentation for me. Um, uh, our public health uh, uh, infectious disease department uh, put put this awesome um, um, presentation for me. So I'll go to slide two. Okay, thank you. Uh, a lot of you already know about uh, Nunavik and the Inuit Nunangat, but uh, I wanted to start by um, talking about our, our, our region here in Nunavik. Um, we have a mass land area uh, of 417,938 square kilometers, and um, our, our um, communities consist of 14 coastal community, seven on the Ngava and on seven on the Hudson Coast. Um, as every, most of you are aware, we have no road access between our communities um, from Nunavik to the rest of Canada. So um, we transport or travel by air and um, sea, the sea lift uh, also supp brings supplies in the summer. Um, Nine out of our 14 villages um, are, are, are outside of the tree line. Um, since the, the 2018 statistics, our population is estimated at 13,778, 777. I say eight because I, I knew that somebody just had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we have a very young population. 50% of our population is less than 25 years old. Next. Okay, next. Okay. Um, history of tuberculosis in Nunavik uh, um, has a long history. Uh, TB is an ongoing epidemic in Nunavik and m most of the Inuit Nunangat. And this epidemic started after contact with Europeans in the 19th and 20th century. <clears throat> and um, in Nunavik, it was estimated to have been first introduced to the region in the early 1900s based on genetic data. And following its introduction, it spread rapidly among the Inuit. Um, but due to a number of interventions in the 50s, including the first antibiotics against TB, Nunavik started to see significant decreases in the TB incidence in the 60s and the 70s. The um, TB then stabilized in the mid 1980s, but starting in 2006 and 7, it began to rise again. Next. Um, <clears throat> When TB spread among Northern Inuit communities in the 50s and 60s, thousands were transported to Southern hospitals and sanatoriums for treatment. So from 50s to 69, a specially designed Coast Guard ship named the C.D. Howe made summer trips to Inuit communities in the Eastern Arctic. I remember being on that ship 
and uh, it was called the Matavik. Matavik means taking your shirt off, and that's how they used to take x-rays. It was known as the place where you took your top off. So, um, and once the doctors decided who needed to go south for treatment in the hospitals, these patients were not permitted to go ashore to collect belongings or say goodbye to family and friends. So it was, this ship was associated a lot to um, taking family away and some were never seen again. And uh, many of them, many of the families were not notified when a TB patient died um, during their stay in the South. And the, the dead were buried in pauper's graves in a Southern cemetery uh, paid for by the Department of Northern Affairs at the time. Next. In March 8, 2019, I, we all recall the Prime Minister delivered an apology to Inuit for the federal government's, um, I guess, mismanagement of TB epidemic from the 1940s to the 60s. So you will see here quoted uh, the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau's um, speech in which he apologized um, for how um, this uh, the management of the TB epidemic um, was, um, was very hard on, on the Inuit of Canada. He also announced the launch of the Nanilavut initiative, let's find them, uh, developed in partnership with Inuit to help families and communities find information on loved ones sent away during the TB epidemic. And I, I, I know that some families uh, have found their loved ones. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't think they found everyone, but uh, it helped put a closure to many families. Um, this, uh, this slide shows incidents of TB in Nunavik compared to Quebec uh, from 2015 to 2020. Um, the TB is in Nunavik is substantially higher than the Quebec overall, as you can see. And the average incidence was 298 out of 1,000 for Nunavik from 2015 to 2020 inclusive versus three out of a thousand, 100,000 for all of Quebec during this time. Um, the average incidence for Nunavik excluding 2020 is uh, 335 out of 100,000, where no change for Quebec, where it is approximate 100 that in Nunavik. So, and this uh, 30 years of TB, the number of cases and incidents in Nunavik from 1990 to 21, as you can see, the highest incidence during this time was in 2012, related to an outbreak in one of our communities. Since then, rates have continued to be high. And sadly, in 2017, we had our first case of death resulting from TB in Nunavik since 1993. The, the, the histogram shows the number of cases per year between 1990 and, 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 and 2000. And the total height of each column is the number of cases for that year using the left Y axis of the figure. So these cases have been colored based on whether they were microbiologically confirmed or TB bacteria grew or probable. Uh, most of the probable cases are in children because they are more challenging to diagnose and because it is more difficult to get sputum samples from them. As you can see also the number of cases per year was relatively low and stable throughout most of the 1990s and early 2000s. Then starting around 2007 and 8 we started to see an increase. In 2012, we hit out uh, our peak with the highest number of cases, 75, most 88% of which were in one community. 
Um, following that, our TB incidence has continued to be higher than the preceding years. Next. Here is comparing TB cases in 2019 versus 2020. Um, the rate for 2020 is much lower compared to the years before, possibly due to TB screenings in three communities, which were done between 2018 and 2020. And the fiscal distancing measures in place for the COVID-19 which can also reduce, reduce TB transmission. However, cases might be artificially lower for 2020 due to del delays in diagnosis. So as shown, on the, as shown as in the last slide, the incidences has been consistently high for the past decade. However, we have noticed a large drop in cases between 2019 and 2020. So the above shows the number of cases uh, per village for communities with cases for each of these years. And um, the possible reasons for this drop are on the slide. Next. So the demographics of TB cases in Nunavik 2015-2020 being included. Um, generally more males than females. 60% of all cases, and the tend to be younger, um, nearly 70% have been under the age of 30, and 27% of all cases are between zero and nine years, 19% between 10 and 19 years, and 23% between 20 and 29 years. So the rationale for this six year period versus five years, because 2020 is a bit of an outlier. So um, this shows the number of cases formed by sex for each year from 2015 to 2020 inclusive. Um, the number of cases who were male was equal to or higher than females across nearly all age categories over time. And this is similar to what is seen in other settings where there are more TB cases among males than females. <clears throat> While <clears throat> often the zero to nine year, sorry, <clears throat> age category has the highest number compared to any single other age category. The majority of cases are above this age. Also notably nearly 70% of our cases are under the age of 30 with most cases linked recent to recent transmissions. This is in contrast to much of Canada where older age groups tend to be more represented among TB cases. Next. Why is TB so high in Nunavik? Um, the reasons for high TB rates of, uh, in Nunavik are multifactorial and linked to the social determinants of health. Housing is likely one most important factor of many. In 2016, 52% of Nunavimut reported living in overcrowded homes uh, where there is at least one less bedroom than needed compared to 8.5% of Canadians overall. And 33% of Inuit also reported that there were people living in their house for a period of time because they had nowhere else to live during the preceding year. And this is uh, from Hanuyuk Pita 2017 health survey. Next, focusing on housing. Uh, housing shortage related to very high cost of bringing in material and workers. Uh, for example, a 2008 assessment reported a cost of $345,000 to build a house of uh, approximately 100 square meters in Kujua compared to less than half that for the same size in Quebec City, uh, Society Habitation de Quebec in 2014. Limited priving, private housing market, most Inuit live in subsidized housing due to high costs. And the growing population size also contributes to the shortage. We have a high birth rate. 
Next. Okay. Um, the poor maintenance is also an issue. Preventative maintenance needs. Uh, the budget uh, is $13 million uh, when the actual uh, cost is $4 million. Um, well, the actual budget is $4 million. And the studies done in Nunavik have shown um, that overcrowding, how, uh, overcrowding associated with TB infection when residing with a person with smear positive disease and progression to active TB disease. This represents a major area of ongoing advocacy with the Canadian government. I hope I'm still clear because I'm getting signal that my internet is weak. So poor maintenance is also, uh, well, yeah, I just did that next, please. Um, focusing on food security, uh, Nunavik food security policy and action plan, streamline guidelines, principles and actions for Nunavik Mute to access food needed for a healthy and active life, rooted in Inuit culture and practices and that support regional economic well-being and self-reliance. Short-term action plan uh, to mitigate the consequences of food insecurity such as Food stamps as incentive for LTBI treatment, acceptance and compliance. Uh, distribution of meals or boxes of food to people in need or food programs for children um, in school. Um, next. So reinforcing the support to local projects that aim to contribute to food security like community kitchens and gardening projects, cooking activities with country food, meals, distribution to elders, uh, more, and more recently COVID-19 pandemic supporting communities to organize food hampers or meals distribution projects to people in need. And uh, we have a good partnership with the Kadivik uh, Ilisaknilri School Board and, and the Breakfast Club of Canada to offer breakfast programs in almost all communities. Um, in addition, a regional strategy on food security is being developed with other regional organizations where more than 150 people participated uh, across the region to provide their input on what they would like to see happening in Nunavik to improve the food security and develop a sustainable Inuit led food system. So with the breakfast program, only two schools have don't, don't have such a program. And we don't have a date yet when this strategy will be replete, re released. Um, surely the pandemic has really slowed down our work, but um, we will definitely give a push in the coming months to move forward with this. Next. So uh, what's being done to address TB in Nunavik? Well, uh, the Inuit TB Elimination Task Force um, is there under the leadership of uh, ITK and National Action Framework for TB Elimination in the, in the Inuit Nunanga and joint efforts of Inuit regions, governments of NWT, Nunavut, uh, Labrador and Quebec. Um, under Indigenous Services Canada. 2017-18 federal budget included an envelope of 27.5 million over five years. So uh, we started on our um, regional action plans against TB, um, which is in response to the TB free Inuit Nunangat's call for action for Nunavik, Quebec. Next. So the goals and objectives of the NRAP TB uh, is to eliminate TB in Nunavik by 2030 and to reduce the incidence of TB to less than one case per a thousand people per year in Nunavik in 2030. One active case every five to seven years. 
So the target for 2025 is to reduce by at least 50% the incidence rate of active TB compared to 2016 from 300 cases per 100,000 to less than 150 cases, 21 active cases per year. So the five pillars of NRAP is the governance, the clinical intervention, intervention on social determinants of TB, four, research monitoring and evaluation, and last, communication. So the challenges and opportunities for TB elimination are the high clinical staff turnover and low retention of local staff, outbreak management and human resources, absence of accredited and easily available trainings, limited local capacity for diagnostics, lab x-ray expert, low LTBI treatment completion rates, and stigma and marginalization factors. Um, the opportunities are the federal financial commitment that 27.5 million, uh, community engagement and ownership of the NRAP, hiring, training and retention of Inuit healthcare workers and community-wide uh, or targeted regular TB screenings and intensive communication education campaigns using traditional medias and social networks and the partnership with one, researchers six, two, Institute one, National Sante Public and McGill University. Next. So uh, this slide just shows the uh, continuum of the com community engagement during the implementation of the NRAP, where we want to inform and consult, uh, involve, collaborate and empower. Next. Um, this um, slide also just um, gives further detail on how we want to inform the communities of up upcoming TV screenings and to consult multiple, uh, consult, have cons consultations um, with different communities and involved by participating in choosing the timing, settings and participants, and to collaborate and participate in incident command committees for TB mass screening, and liaise with the community and lead communication, community engagement activities, and to share leadership. So to define and co-create a common vision of the role of the community health worker uh, in TB programs, and this is the uh, this is an area where FAS is, is uh, working with one of our um, public health uh, nurses. Next, next, um, TB screenings in communities. Um, the screenings are an important part of our TB program. Uh, where we conducted two population-wide screenings in two of our communities in 2018 and 19. So an additional targeted screening was done of ages two to 19 in another community in 2020. And the decision to screen a whole community or a portion of it is based on local epidemiology and discussion with the community leaders. Well, without the participant participation of the community leaders, um, it's, it's a challenge um, to do these. So the results um, of the 2019 TB screening were uh, that out of um, 1,199 eligible, 1,166 1, were screened. So that was uh, a very good uh, turnout, 97%. Um, there, there was a very strong participation uh, similar to TB screenings in other communities. And uh, seven cases of active TB were identified and all have successfully completed their treatment. 
31 people with new latent TB infections were identified, 4% of those who had tuberculin skin test done. And acceptance and completion of treatment for latent TB infection is important to prevent future disease and spread. <clears throat> this is an area we're working really hard to improve in Nunavik. Next. So we have ongoing and up upcoming public health activities for 2021, community health agent curriculum development and training, so that to empower and value Inuit role in the fight against TB um, and support groups in three communities to increase awareness and education and offer a platform for peer support for patients and their families and the TB population-wide screenings in two communities for 2021. So to conclude, um, we're all very aware that uh, tuberculosis has a long and complicated history in Nunavik. And despite our efforts, it continues to be a major problem. And uh, the COVID-19 also has brought new uh, challenges but um, Nunav and Muta are working hard together to keep moving towards our TB goals and to improve the health of, of our region. <clears throat> Through our ongoing efforts, we will succeed in reducing the burden of TB. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, sorry, I took a lot of time, but um, I think it was worth it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was excellent, Minnie, really, and certainly not, not at all too much time, actually. You're right on time. So, um, um, so now we have a chance for questions and discussion. Um, e yeah, so first I wanted to see if any of the trainees have a question. Otherwise, we'll turn to the usual suspects. Um, but uh, perhaps giving an opportunity for any of the trainees for a comment or a, or a question to our keynote speaker. Um, well, okay, while waiting for a student or a trainee, perhaps Marcel, Marcel, you have a question which you noted after the students, but I'll let you go first, please. Thank you, Dick. Um, Minnie, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 was a sort of a strange year for all of us, and it, it, depending on where you worked and where you lived, we all had different experiences. Can you describe how people uh, interacted and whether there was social distancing or not during the year 2020? Because I saw that it looks like the TB rates went down. It may just be because we don't have diagnosis. Were people going from place to place or were people kind of locking down the same way we've been doing in Montreal? Well, we were, <clears throat> we were hit quite hard by COVID-19 in March of last year. Uh, in one community, uh, we, had, um, um, we had cases just in one community, uh, although there were odd ones in, in some communities. So our, our whole region went into lockdown. Um, uh, so, and we're respecting all public health measures by, by distancing. And that is why in the presentation, we mentioned that uh, it may be due to these measures of distancing and not interacting that um, TB um, has not, um, been uh, observed to be on the rise, but it, as you mentioned also, it could well be also that people are not going in for um, consultations, but we continue to do um, um, x-rays um, for those communities that are known to have these rates. Great, thank you. Thanks, Minnie. Um, so, um, um, Madhu also has a question. Madhu, go up, please go ahead. Yes, um, Minnie, thank you so much. Um, as a center full of uh, people who care about ending TB, we would love to know from you, how is it that we can help? For example, 
should we be advocating with the federal government to increase the investments uh, in the um, in the ITK national plan that you mentioned? Or is there anything else that we can do sitting in Montreal that could uh, help strengthen your uh, hands in, uh, in ending TB in the Inuit communities? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly, it can help us uh, to, to lobby more the governments. Uh, ITK is taking the lead on this, but all of the, the Inuit regions are working with ITK. And certainly, uh, we have people like Faz and our public health director, uh, Dr. Rachet, that is very much involved uh, at the ITK level and, and Faz working with our region. And, and yes, um, it, could, it can, it's not, how do you say, it could really help also that uh, although the federal government has really um, committed themselves to, to help us eliminate TB in Inuit Nunangad, um, support and lobbying always helps. Thank you. Um, Minnie, I wonder if I can ask you one question. I was um, really, really struck by that 97% community participation in the mass TB screening. That's, a, I think, the best community participation I've seen of any mass event, uh, screening of any kind uh, ever. So I wonder if you could spend a minute or two just kind of telling us what, what you think contributed to that or how you managed to achieve that. Um, you know, including, you know, pre-meetings, whatever, just how did you manage that? Well, it, 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 it took a lot of teamwork. Our public health team um, really did organize the, the communication um, way ahead of time uh, and, and develop the plan with the community. Uh, it's key to work with the uh, local authorities, uh, especially the mayor. Uh, it took some doing with some communities, but uh, the mayors are, are very engaged in ensuring that their, 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 their community be healthy and, and TB free. So it, I, I have to say that it, a lot of the um, um, success uh, came from uh, working hand in hand with the local authorities. Um, and you know the, the 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 setup of the teams and 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 having the community uh, engaged to the point where they are the ones to make the decision of where this mass screening will will be taking place, uh, and because they're the ones that know their community, uh, and in one community, um, the, we 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 had a hard time finding a suitable place for for mass um, screening. So we worked with the community's uh, youth uh, center, which was in, 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 in bad disrepair. So we took it upon ourselves to um, offer to, to um, um, how do you say, remodel or refurbish the building uh, and then give it to them um, renovated. So these kind of things, um, working with the community, I think creates uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, link and, and that's why there was such a high, high rate of success, community involvement. As always, I'm muted and talking. Okay, uh, thank you, Minnie, that's very helpful and very interesting. So fixing the youth center and refurbishing it got the youth excited about participating in the survey. That's great. Um, uh, so uh, Sonali perhaps has a question. Yeah, it is correct. Uh, so do I read or it is okay not to read the question? No, no, just ask the question as you wish. Yeah, uh, like I wanted to ask, like what was the eligibility criteria uh, for the population to fall under the screen group? I mean, was it the diagnosed case only or the direct contact with the case and how they decided that this population need to be screened and not this? Um, in a, a couple of the communities, it was a full, full community screening and in one community, it was a target group. 
it all depends on the community uh, level of TB. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, any other comments or questions from, uh, we have multiple uh, names of listeners. Okay, so again, Minnie, thank you very much. Uh, it's always like a real pleasure to hear you speak practical stuff on the ground, but also real leadership uh, demonstrated in many regards in terms of the Inuit involvement, Inuit, uh, Inuit led initiatives. And uh, again, I, I, as, as, as Madhu said, uh, you know, um, anything we can do to help uh, let us know and uh, we hope we really hope that this TB elimination by 2030 happens. We yes, thank you, Dick. Uh, nice to see you and uh, I'll, I'll continue on with you for the right. afternoon. Thank right. you for this opportunity. Thank you, terrific. Thank you, okay, so next it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Penny Heaton. So Dr. Heaton is the Chief Executive Officer of the Gates Medical Research Institute uh, it, with particular responsibility for the GSK vaccine, which she's going to talk about. Um, so the Gates Medical Research Institute, or Gates MRI, is a nonprofit biotech organization uh, applying translational sciences to combat diseases that disproportionately impact the poor uh, in low and middle income countries. And uh, I'm gonna stop there. There's obviously much more to say about Dr. Heaton, but uh, rather than go too long, I'll let Dr. Heaton do all the talking from here. So Penny, thank you very much for coming and joining us. And we're very interested to hear what you have to say about what Gates is doing for TB, please. Well. Thank you, Dick, and uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be invited to your annual research day, uh, World TB Day. Uh, I really appreciate being able to participate. Uh, and also want to thank uh, McGill University for all your collaboration on TB, on the NTB work, as well as maternal, newborn, and child health work, uh, and, uh, and in other areas. And many, I, we haven't had a chance to meet, but thank you for that beautiful presentation as well on the epidemiology at, at, in Nunavik. It, it really, um, there's so many striking similarities between that epidemiology and what we're seeing in the countries that we're working in, in Southern Africa, Southeast Asia, et cetera. So uh, thank you for helping set up my presentation uh, in a very robust way. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed hearing that. So I'm going to try to share my slides because I have some animation and I think it might be easier if I share. Let's see. So can you see them by any chance? You can. Great. Excellent. Okay. And is it in the proper mode? Is it in a good can you can is it in presentation mode i hope no no you know okay let me see if i can get it in how about now yes oh great okay excellent so i uh, wanted to start off by telling the story of my personal connection with tuberculosis uh, and i think tuberculosis is the reason why i chose a career in infectious diseases uh, my father had tuberculosis two years before I was born. And as I got a little older, he would hold up his chest x-ray. He got annual screenings for several years. And he would hold up his chest x-ray and point to their scar on his, in, on his lung. And he would tell me stories about how there was a germ that was living in that scar and that that germ was asleep and it could wake up at any time. And he could cough it out and transmit TB to me and my siblings. And in fact, you know, it was one of his fears. Uh, and that really, you know, maybe I should have been frightened by that, but instead I was really fascinated by that and uh, ended up, you know, my fascination has persisted ever since. Now, of course, my father was very fortunate. He uh, was diagnosed early. He was treated with some of the new antimicrobials that had just become available the decade before. And uh, he recovered, even though he had very severe disease and was in a sanatorium for eight months, uh, he did uh, recover and I'm here to tell the story. 
But of course, that's not the case in low income countries. It is, you know, an often an overlooked epidemic. We see the numbers for COVID, you know, every night on the evening news. And, you know, in 2020, there were 1.8 million deaths from COVID globally. That number for TB the year before was 1.5 million, but also the year before that, and the year before that, and the year before that, and the year before that. You know, and, and in fact, you know, since 2000, even though the treatments that we have have averted 60 million deaths from TB, there's still been 40 million that have died. So it's truly an overlooked epidemic. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, it is concentrated in just a few countries and low resource settings. It, it, it is a disease of the poor. Uh, and in fact, eight countries account for over two thirds of all of the TB mortality in the world. And usually that's my dog barking, but now I hear someone else's. <laughs> and. Uh, it is the most deadly infection. It was only surpassed by COVID in 2020 with 10 million cases of tuberculosis every year. You know, it's it's staggering to think that 25% of the world's population is, is estimated to have a latent form of TB uh, and, and that they aren't aware, many of them, most of them not being aware that they have it. And of course, there's this disproportionate burden in those living with HIV. But similar to what many presented for the Nunavik, in the Nunavik region, uh, we also see in our countries, the majority of lives taken are those in young and middle-aged adults. These are some data. This is a slide that Dr. Hatherow uh, has uh, given me and, and uh, shared with me uh, that I've been using quite frequently that shows the prevalence of TB in Cape Town, South Africa by age group. And you could see here um, that the, the increase in prevalence, uh, but with the bulk of the disease occurring in adolescents and younger adults who are right in the prime of their lives. So if we could ever address this epidemic, the, the, the benefit for those countries would just be phenomenal because you would then be benefiting your uh, most productive members of society with regard uh, to economic advancement. Uh, so, uh, and, and also, you know, what this, uh, this pattern, this epidemiologic pattern does with these high rates of TB infection in children and adolescents resulting in very uh, high latent TB prevalence in young adults, of course, it also sets up those with HIV, that group that is most at, at risk for HIV infection uh, to also then be co-infected with TB. The incidence is declining, that's good news, uh, but unfortunately it's just not declining at the rates that we need. Uh, you have some of the targets here for reduction in mortality, 35%, and we've not seen nearly that uh, 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 that uh, we were, we that the, that the WHO has targeted. Uh, the same with economic costs. I mean, in our countries, the low resource settings, you know, when they get a prescription for TB, there's no money, there's no insurance to cover that prescription. They have to pay for that out of pocket uh, typically. And of course, then um, they often can't get the prescription filled or they get it filled and they take it for a while, but they can't get it refilled. And then the next thing you know, we have multi-drug resistant TB, which is much more expensive. So the economic costs and the, and the individuals that are facing economic catastrophe is, is enormous. But as I said, we do have tools to address the epidemic. And as many shared, you know, some of the amazing work that uh, they're doing uh, there in the Inuit population. Uh, we have infection prevention with the BCG vaccine. We have preventive treatments for TB and people living with HIV, obviously. Uh, we have, um, you know, national policies for screening and testing for, for TB. Uh, and uh, we have delivery programs uh, that you all are, are very familiar with uh, that are uh, working to end the, the TB epidemic, as well as trying to manage different risk factors and comorbidities as well. Uh, but again, not reaching those targets uh, that we were hopeful to reach in with respect to TB treatment and TB prevention. 
So what could be the answer? And, you know, I think vaccines are an important tool towards ending the TB epidemic, and it may very well take vaccines to actually end it once and for all. And the WHO has been, uh, you know, obviously uh, looking at this for many years, and we've been having several meetings with them over the last few years with um, the emergence of some of the data I'm going to talk about here in a bit on uh, the M72 vaccine. And so, yes, we want to continue to look at BCG vaccine as a prophylactic tool for neonates and infants and also improve the vaccines for neonates and infants. But can we target a vaccine for adolescents and adults, those most productive members of society? And, um, uh, and that is uh, what uh, the WHO has made as a priority for the vaccine development efforts right now. So there are a lot of challenges with developing a TB vaccine. You all know these well. It's a very complicated pathogen. We still don't understand the entirety of its life cycle from the point of infection through to subclinical disease through to active disease. Uh, it's lived a long time with its human host and figured out how to very cleverly evade the immune system. Uh, we don't understand what an immune response is needed to protect against TB. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's been done on that, that's ongoing, especially with the new immunologic profiling tools that we have now, but we still don't understand that. So what that means is that if we want to develop a vaccine uh, for regulatory approval and uh, broad use, then the only way to do that right now is to actually do big efficacy studies. So we have to, you know, do studies where we give, you know, randomized, give one group vaccine, one group placebo, follow them for, um, and follow them and, and monitor them as to whether or not they develop active TB disease, and then compare the rates of TB in the two groups. And those trials are large. It's estimated, uh, just to give you a preview of what I'm going to tell you in a minute, it's estimated that, you know, a trial uh, to evaluate the efficacy of the M72 vaccine will be somewhere between 18 to 30,000 subjects. And so that means they're also very expensive. And unfortunately, animal models currently are not optimized to be predictive and to help us uh, with this evaluation. As you all also know, TB is an area that's really severely underfunded. Uh, and that's because the burden is really low in high income countries and there's not a big market there. So there's not a lot of interest from the private sector in the funding is uh, coming from governments and philanthropic organizations. So I did want to give a nod to BCG before I talk about the GSK vaccine. Uh, just because, you know, it's the first use, uh, medical use was 1921. Uh, and it is celebrating its 100th birthday. I thought it would be uh, kind of fun to take a moment and go back to what the world was like in 1921. Uh, the global literacy rate, uh, as you can see there, was uh, uh, pretty low. Uh, it only took five days to get from London to New York, uh, although I guess I don't even know if we can go from London to New York today at all with the COVID travel restrictions, but <laughs> they would... The hamburger bun had just been uh, invented and only 8% of homes had a landline. Now, maybe we're also back full circle to that. I don't know how many of you have got rid of your landlines. My husband and I, we just use our mobile uh, as well. Uh, but uh, of course, these are the inventors of the BCG vaccine and, um, you know, a, a, a nod to them. And it's, it's amazing what has been accomplished with the BCG vaccine. You know, it's the most commonly used vaccine. It's been given to more people in the world than any other vaccine. And we certainly know uh, that the benefits have uh, been great in neonates and young children, although efficacy has been variable across different regions and um, across different age groups. It certainly made a significant contribution uh, to helping prevent TB in children. But again, what can we um, develop for those adolescents and young adults? And that's where the GSK M72 vaccine uh, comes in. And you know, it is, I think, the most promising new vaccines to be developed since the BCG vaccine. 
uh, did come out of the GSK laboratories and uh, the development was supported by ARIS and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They developed this candidate through uh, phase 2B. And these are the data here on the slide. No, not mine. It's like a TV meeting right I know. Now. I'm going to put it in my ear, but I have to okay. go to the... Okay. And these are the data, as you can see here on the slide, 50% um, uh, efficacy overall in this study. And depending on what population you're looking at, uh, the efficacy even went up to 75% in some of the subpopulations. And remember, these are in you know, adolescents, young adults who were, well, older adolescents and adults who were already infected with TB. Now, I will tell you that, you know, my team, I was at the foundation at the time this was done, and my team at the foundation, we actually gave this study a pretty low probability of success because that was setting the bar so high to actually prevent progression to pulmonary disease in those already infected. And uh, so we were all, I personally was surprised by the results, but thrilled with the results, obviously, uh, that, we, that this efficacy was observed. Uh, so we did in-license the vaccine from GSK. Um, we announced it early last year. COVID had just, um, you know, started. So I, I don't think anybody even knew we had in-licensed it uh, uh, because uh, there was so much else going on at the time. Uh, and uh, GSK has been a great partner, actually, in helping support technology transfer and providing adjuvant for the program. And we're continuing the development. So I can tell you a little bit more about uh, what we've been up to now. I wanted to first just show um, a slide showing the typical path for vaccine development, starting from discovery through to preclinical animal studies. And then you have that valley of death, as we call it, where that translational medicine uh, entry, uh, where in addition to the animal studies, you know, the manufacturing process for the vaccine has to be developed, the clinical assays have to be developed, you have to do your toxicology studies and make sure the vaccine is safe. And then finally you get into phase one studies to look at safety, phase two studies to get your proof of concept for efficacy. Of course, that's the data that I just showed you on the previous slide for the M72 vaccine. And then phase three to confirm safety and efficacy and move on to regulatory approval. And as you can see along the bottom there, this typically takes a very long time to do. Now, COVID has totally blown these timelines out of the water. And, uh, you know, I, I've just been amazed. And it, because of the, the uh, nucleic acid technology, the recombinant technology that they're using with the adenovirus vectors and the subunit protein uh, vaccines, uh, as well as uh, doing a lot of these activities in parallel, that's what has allowed the acceleration with COVID and of course having a huge disease burden that enabled uh, the ability to do efficacy trials uh, relatively quickly uh, has enabled that very fast pace. But I have been challenging my team to say, what could we do to speed up the development of the M72 vaccine? So we have actually started, in, we call it an innovation that matters uh, working group uh, that is really looking at what do we learn from COVID and is there anything that we could apply to actually speed up the development of uh, this GSK vaccine. So um, to give you an update on what we uh, were able to do, even with COVID going on last year. So remember, we just in licensed the vaccine in early 2020, uh, GSK transferred the data, assays, etc. And uh, so the first study that we've done and, and we were able to get it started last fall, even with COVID, uh, is a, a phase two study looking at safety in HIV infected individuals. And the reason for that is we really think it's important to include HIV infected individuals in phase three studies. And so we want to confirm the safety and immunogenicity in that group. So, you know, a huge thank you to the investigators in South Africa who are uh, doing the study to the regulatory agency in South Africa uh, who approved the study. We did everything remotely and, and um, you know, through Zoom calls, et cetera. And they, um, they've just been amazing in getting this study up and going. So we anticipate that this study will be fully enrolled by June, uh, maybe 
end of July at the latest, and then we'll follow these individuals for a year to confirm the safety and the immunogenicity data and get ready then for them to be in the phase three studies. So that's ongoing. The uh, second thing we're doing this year is, um, that we'll be starting this year is epidemiology studies. So remember I said we need somewhere between 18 to 30,000 individuals in the big phase three study to confirm safety, confirm efficacy. And so we need to be in areas where there's very high prevalence of tuberculosis. And so what are those areas? So we've been uh, looking at all the epidemiology data that's available. And uh, we are going to sites in those areas to confirm the epidemiology of TB and uh, to also uh, help start to build site capacity and get them ready for the studies. We hope that all of that will get off the ground by the end of the year. We're doing all of the preparatory work for that now. And, um, uh, and, and so we are, um, we're, we're, we're hopeful that, that this will, will all come through and, and that uh, we'll be in good stead uh, then for the phase three trials. And then of course, based on these data, well, before I get to the phase three, uh, the other thing we're doing now is the manufacturing development. Uh, so GSK will continue to supply the AS01E adjuvant, uh, but um, we are responsible for the antigen manufacturer. So we're doing that through a, a contract manufacturing organization. But we had to do, you know, the tech transfer and then um, the what we call the scale up. So it needs to be at commercial scale and made just like you could make it uh, for um, after it's approved we have to have that same process in place for the phase three materials, the phase three vaccine supply. So that's also a big part of what we're working on right now, to get that manufacturing process locked down so that we can produce the vaccine for the phase three trial. And then that will be the same process that will be used ultimately uh, for the market as, as uh, we call it, um, in, in, but in this case, in low income countries. And then finally, it's the phase three study itself. Uh, so um, we are, you know, we have two, what sound like simple questions, but of course it'll take a lot of work to uh, answer those questions. We want to confirm that the M72 ASO1E vaccine protects individuals who are already infected and protects them from progressing to disease. We want to know how long and at least uh, start that first look at durability. And then finally, we also want to start to understand what about individuals who have never been infected? Will it also protect them from being infected and or uh, from progressing uh, to uh, pulmonary disease? Uh, so a, a lot of work cut, cut out for us over these next few years. And we're looking at all of this taking right now, our estimate is um, all the way to 2028 before we have the first interim analysis. That's a long time. So that's why we've, to, we've put together this group to look at what can we do, how can we innovate to try to accelerate that. So, um, and also I should mention that in parallel, we're certainly working with the World Health Organization and regulatory authorities so we can make sure that we are clear on what data that they need to see in order to approve the vaccine and make recommendations uh, for use in areas with high prevalence of TB. So we're working with the Product Development Vaccine Advisory Committee at, um, at the World Health Organization and with their scientific advisory group of experts and presenting to them. Uh, we presented last year, we'll be uh, discussing our ongoing plans with them this coming year as well. But this slide gives you an idea of some of the things we're trying to do to um, accelerate approval. And um, if we could just identify what that mechanism of protection, what the immunologic mechanism of protection is, that could really be incredibly helpful. Uh, and so the work that we're doing on the correlates, and it's, when I say we, it is a huge group. We have many, many partners, as you all know, many partners that are working on this. This is not something that, you know, one institution or one group does. It, it takes a village of institutions and, and organizations and laboratories to do this type of work. 
but we're looking at everything from, you know, the typical humoral immunity, looking at antibody um, uh, to different aspects of cellular immunity, as well as innate immunity, which of course we all think is, um, and, and especially trained immunity uh, has an important role in protection against TB. We've got several exploratory um, uh, evaluations going on in the omics area as well. And uh, what we're doing right now is we're applying this the way the team did it is they got together groups of experts in these areas, reviewed all the data, got experts together, developed hypotheses, and we've prioritized what work we're doing when. And then we're taking the banked samples from the M72 vaccine, the data that I showed you earlier, and um, there was a, also a BCG booster study that was done as well. And we're applying this to those banked samples to see if we can uh, start to really get a deeper understanding of the immunology uh, that would protect against TB. And then we are uh, potentially going to be looking at, at that uh, for certain in the phase three study and potentially some of this maybe even in the epidemiology study coming up. Because uh, if we could ever unlock this piece of it, we could be so much more efficient you know, not just in the development of the M72 GSK vaccine, but also for other TB vaccines that are coming along uh, that are in the pipeline. So, you know, we, we, there's been progress made in high income countries, but we think that it's so important that we make progress for everyone and uh, not just, you know, not just in COVID, not just in high income countries, but also for, for tuberculosis and especially those individuals in these very high burden countries so that TB becomes a thing of the past. So thank you. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take questions now. I thought I would leave you with uh, this. Um, piece from uh, Dr. Koch's 1905 Nobel uh, lecture, but I love uh, the last line and it says, if the work goes on in this powerful way, then the victory against TB must be won. So we have to try to invent that future that we want to see. So thank you all very much. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you, Penny. Yeah, terrific, terrific lecture. And yes, kind of sobering that in 1905, Robert Koch was saying, goes on in this powerful way. I'm not sure that we've managed to live up to that powerful way and continue the same progress as there was back then. Um, so first again, uh, opportunities for people to ask questions. Uh, just send me a chat message or to everyone. If you have a question, I guess I would have, I see possibly two new messages. Edgar, did I see your hand up? <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, yeah, good, uh, good morning. I was wondering if I can ask you the question if that is appropriate. The first one is, uh, I was wondering if you are uh, following the people that was included in the phase two B trial, just to know if the protection will continue after the two years that it was shown benefit. Yeah, so um, what we have planned right now is to follow for five years, um, and then we would continue even post-approval. So we envision, you know, doing long-term follow-up. We don't have all the details of that worked out right now, but I think, you know, a minimum of five years is uh, the way we have it designed right now. But I, I expect, you know, what we want to understand is will they need a booster dose, and, you know, and when would they need a booster dose, and so we'll just probably continue to follow what we've done in the past with other vaccines, continue to follow in five year increments and, and define that. Yeah. Thank you very much. And the, and the second question is, have you, are you planning to include children or younger population in the new phase three trial? And if so, what problems would, do you need it would imply given that, uh, sorry, uh, uh, using placebo instead of the BCG in this population? Yeah, so it, that's a great question. We, we've been discussing a lot, what is the youngest age group that we would go down to? Um, because, um, and it has a little bit to do with your first question, durability. Because if we have a very long acting vaccine, then we feel more comfortable going down into those younger age groups. So right now we're talking about, are we going to go down at least to age 12? You know, that's the consideration that we have right now. Um, as, as far as children, 
and, and younger infants, uh, we have not considered that yet. Uh, they, you know, there's the BCG vaccine, but what I didn't have time to go into is there's also some, you know, recombinant BCG and improved BCG vaccines that are coming along that are in phase three trials. So could they play a role in the infants and young children and then this vaccine be for adolescents and, and adults? It's going to be really interesting to see how the epidemiology of TB evolves and what we'll ultimately need. But we know that we need to really get the burden down in these young adults in order to um, start to end the TB epidemic. Thank you. So very great much. question. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, uh, Jonathan, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Dick. Edgar actually asked my first question. So it's good I had a second one. Uh, I guess kind of, Going beyond um, funding issues for TB vaccines, I mean, what are the major barriers, I guess, from your perspective to TB vaccine development and what specific things can we learn from COVID vaccine development and the speed of that? What do we need to do kind of as a, as a society, I guess, to increase this? Is this talking about international collaborations, building clinical trial capacity in low middle income countries? Like, what are you just want to know your opinions on how we can make TB like COVID in terms of vaccine development. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great question, and I think you really hit. I mean, number one, I have to say, is funding. Uh, you know, when you're talking about an eighteen thousand to thirty thousand patient study, uh, and you know, with when you add in the manufacturing complexity, you know the all of the scale up and manufacturing um, process development work that has to be done. You know, you're looking at 500 million to a billion dollars. So funding is definitely an issue. And that's not something that a single philanthropic organization can take on. It, you know, it does take uh, funding beyond that. But let's set that aside. And, you know, the, the way that COVID was, um, the vaccines were brought to licensure so quickly as I said, part of it was doing things more in parallel, like just getting some phase one data, you know, well, I'll start all the way at the beginning, you know, for preclinical studies, just doing small animal studies and then going into humans in phase one while um, in parallel moving forward with non-human primate studies, for example, or very quickly adapting going from phase one to phase two and phase two to phase three. So that was part of it. But actually the bigger part of it was the phase three studies were done at so many sites. Now, the, you know, the burden of disease were very, very high. And, and the way those studies were accomplished is they, people, you know, pre-registered for the studies. I mean, they had hundreds of thousands of people that were interested in being in a TB vaccine in a trial and they are in a COVID vaccine trial. And they knew that before they started those studies. And then they had hundreds of sites. So it um, was just this massive, massive, effort. So the question is, can we bring some of that into the TB, you know, vaccine um, work? You know, the EPI study, I don't think I mentioned it, we're looking at, you know, 50 sites uh, that we're going to be doing the EPI studies in and building capacity in those sites. That's a lot to take on. But you know, for 50 sites to enroll 20 or 30,000 subjects, that's going to take a long time. So if there were ways, it could be, you know, 200 sites and we could build capacity. Now, you know, are there 200 sites in the world where the TB prevalence is high enough that we, you know, can get the, um, the answers we need is the question. But I think certainly it can be more than 50. Uh, 50 is what we can manage, but could it be more than 50? So I think you're right. I think it's, it's, it's more sites uh, in TB prevalent areas and, also, I think that pre-registration process is something that we need to pay attention to. We had some experience with that in uh, the Gates MRI um, with a drug trial for COVID. We were studying rivaroxaban for uh, COVID and we did everything remotely and all of our recruitment was done through social media. It was all done through uh, Facebook and, and various other social media uh, outlets and um, 
you know, is there a way in low income countries, they have smartphones. So what can we take from what we learned from that uh, recruitment and, and the telemedicine? We also use telemedicine to enroll all these subjects. We sent all of their supplies to them. We called it a clinic in a box. So they enrolled via social media. We sent them a box with their swabs for testing, their pulse oximeter, uh, you know, their, their meds, uh, their, their pills, uh, the forms that they needed. And then a nurse got on Zoom with them every day or the physician and, uh, you know, and did, did all of their follow-up visits, et cetera. Now we couldn't quite do that, but are there things that we can learn from that to help speed things up or to make them more efficient? Because if we can make them more efficient and get the cost down, then you start to be able to stretch your funds further to expand to um, to other sites. So your question is a really good one and one that we're actually in the process now of really taking those lessons learned from COVID and seeing how we can apply uh, to the M72 program. Okay, thank you, Penny. I'm sure I could ask you many more questions and take up a lot of time, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it for everyone else and uh, thanks for a great talk. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so listen, we just have time for one quick question, uh, which I have in the chat from Tim, and because then we have to get on to the oral presentation. So Tim. Uh, thanks, uh, Penny. I'm just, um, it's maybe not a quick question, but um, I'd be interested to know how you're learning from the experience of uh, 20 years in this business, at least in terms of the PDP era, and what's different about the MRI? What are they doing which is going to really um, uh, learn from uh, that, uh, those two decades of, uh, of uh, previous experience? And why can we hope for um, a vaccine in the next two years that's uh, affordable and available to everyone and uh, the same effectiveness as the mRNA vaccines for COVID? Yeah, great, great 60 question. seconds or less. Yeah, so one thing for certain is, you know, we're the ones that are developing, you know, this vaccine as far as phase three, et cetera, but it's building on all of that work that's been done previously. Uh, and in fact, you know, um, uh, we have uh, folks from ARIS who are now at the foundation and at, uh, at IAVI that uh, advise us every day. And so, and, and uh, you know, certainly very actively involved with TBBI, et, et cetera. So uh, just to reiterate that, I think the other thing is it's not what we have that's unique to us, but what the world has. And that's this golden age of biotechnology that we're living in. And, you know, okay, it's easy for me to say, but, you know, we are really deeply looking at, just had a meeting this morning, came out of it where we're really deeply looking at what is possible with the tools that we have, that we, we didn't have those tools before. We couldn't have done it five years before or ago or 10 years ago, being able to look at the immunology the way that we're looking at it now. So in collaboration with all of these groups that I talked about earlier, um, we're um, really trying to bring all of those efforts together. And, you know, we would hope to be able to identify the immunologic mechanism of protection, to be able to share that with the world, tech transfer assays, whatever needs to be done so that anyone working on other vaccine development can, can have access to that. We would hope that would be the, the holy grail, but if we don't get there, can we just develop assays that better predict who's going to progress to TB so that we can at least make this, the clinical trials simpler? So we're looking at that spectrum, and that's what I hope that, that we can bring to the table uh, here over the next uh, five to 10 years. Great, okay, thank you, Penny. So listen, I'm sure there's a bazillion more questions. I have a few that I didn't get to ask myself, but I'll wait till later. Uh, we have to unfortunately go on to the next part of the agenda, um, which is the, we have six oral presentations from trainees. Uh, I'm gonna add, each person has exactly 10 minutes, including questions. And in fact, your presentation should not exceed eight minutes, ideally seven so that we can, uh, we can uh, have time for questions, okay? But at eight minutes, I'm gonna cut you off, just to be warned. And just to be ready, try to be ready to share your screen and all that stuff as quickly as you can. And I'd again remind everyone to mute themselves when you're not speaking, since we keep having people, people's dogs barking or anyway, various background sounds going on. So, uh, and I'll try to 
sort of say who's up and then who's next, just so that we can, um, just so we can, so this person who's next can kind of uh, get ready, if you know what I mean. So first off is Jean-Yves Dubé. And Jean-Yves, I'll let you uh, go and Sarah will be following him. So Jean-Yves, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Menzies. <clears throat> so uh, can everyone see my screen? Perfect. Okay, let's see. Let's... Sorry. Okay, so I will talk to you today about some of the work that I've done over the course of my PhD. And uh, so the title of this work is Single and Combined Effects of Nod2 and Mingle and Innate Immune Recognition of Live and Dead Mycobacterium Tuberculosis. So just a bit of background. Um, so one of the key points of the work I've been doing was to focus on complete Freund's adjuvant. This is a classical adjuvant used by uh, immunologists a lot to induce immunity or autoimmunity in different animal models. And it's, it's basically mineral oil plus heat killed mycobacterium tuberculosis. And uh, without the TB, it's, cons it's just called incomplete Freund's adjuvant and that's just mineral oil alone. And uh, many of you may be more familiar about the kind of immunity, so it elicits cell media immunity, and many of you would recognize this as uh, what you see in a positive TST reaction, which is caused by a live MTB infection, of course. So this is a type four hypersensitivity reaction mediated by T cells. So when Jules Freund was developing this adjuvant, he noted in a review that it seems unlikely that the same factor or factors in the tubercular bacillus that in so many ways influence the immune response of host antigens to uh, host to unrelated antigens, that they should have no role in the infection that they cause. So we sort of rephrase this in a hypothesis that mycobacterial factors that alter immunity do play synergistic roles during tuberculosis. So two of the such factors are uh, cell wall peptidoglycan. And uh, so fragments of this are recognized by the host pattern recognition receptor NOD2, which is located inside host phagocytes. And this peptidoglycan is historically thought to be one of the key ingredients in CFA. Another one of these factors is a cord factor, which is located in the mycomembrane of mycobacteria. And this is recognized by the host pattern recognition receptor MINKL, which is on the surface of host phagocytes. And what we know about Minkel and cord factor uh, recognition is that it's sufficient for granuloma formation. So we created a model where to assess uh, the immunity induced by CFA in an animal model. So in this model, we immunize mice against ovalbumin, just as an example antigen, either in the presence of CFA or IFA. And then we looked at uh, T cells in the draining lymph nodes one week after immunization. So mice were immunized. Uh, we either had wild type mice or mice that were knockout for NOD2, Minkle, or both NOD2 and Minkle, so double knockout mice. And first, what we can see is when the cell, T cells are taken and stimulated ex vivo with ovalbumin that they produce interferon gamma, whereas if they're unstimulated, they don't and that uh, CFA immunized animals produce more interferon gamma than IFA immunized an animals, which is as expected given the role of uh, mycobacteria to induce interferon gamma responses. And that lastly, that the knockouts, whether it's not too minkle or double knockout have about a 30 to 50% reduction in the interferon antigen specific interferon gamma response. And just one, and one more point that the double knockout seems to be have about a similar reduction as the single knockout, suggesting that in the absence of one of these receptors, the other one is actually doesn't play a role, suggesting that then that they have some kind of cooperativity. Um, not to and Minkle also sense a TB, live TBs during a live infection. So this is just a simple macrophage infection in vitro where we looked at TNF alpha production in the supernatant from these macrophages after infection at various time points. And what we is quite clear is that in the absence of Minkle, the amount of TNF produced from these macrophages is reduced substantially, but even more in the absence of NOD2. But interestingly, that in the absence of both receptors, the, the result seems to be quite similar to NOD2, suggesting again that NOD2 is the dominant role uh, of these two uh, receptors or that there's some kind of synergy between them. And the similar result is seen if the bacteria are dead as well. 
So lastly, we wanted to know, since NOD2 and Minkle seem to be important during, um, to induce immune responses to mycobacteria, we wanted to know if, what, if they have an important role during live infection with mycobacteria. So we, in, we uh, infected uh, mice by aerosol with mycobacterium tuberculosis H37RV using a low dose of 30 bacteria in the lungs after one day. And we followed these mice over a course of a year to see uh, at the rate of survival compared to wild type. And what was obvious is that the, the double knockout mice clearly died at a faster rate than the wild type, although this only occurred very late in infection. So uh, the median survival time was about 280 days for double knockout mice. Not two single knockout mice seem to be about the same as double knockout and minkle knock single knockout mice are sort of in between wild type and uh, then in other knockouts with sort of with borderline statistical significance. So in conclusion, we know that not two and minkle clearly uh, contribute to cell media immune response to MTB, whether the bacteria are alive or dead, and that the double knockout generally looks like one of the single knockouts suggesting its cooperativity between these receptors. The absence of either or both of Minkle and NOT2 accelerates mortality, although this is late, and the NOT2 single knockout resembles a double knockout as Minkle is intermediate. Um, from this and the work that we published on the CFA thing, stuff, we know that uh, Minkle and NOT2 can be exploited together in adjuvants and that their uh, respective ligands work synergistically in, in various systems in that uh, the combination of Minkle and NOT2 ligands gives a larger immune response than you'd expect for either of them if you would add them together mathematically. And then lastly, that sensors like Minkle and NOT2, pattern recognition receptors as they're called, seem to be largely dispensable for MTB control, which is in contrast to effectors like interferon gamma or TNF alpha, which in, without interferon gamma, for instance, mice will tend to die within one to two months uh, of infection. And um, lastly, that's because these uh, things like not to minkle, they seem to be redundant. So in the absence of one or even a few pattern recognition receptors, uh, the host is still able to survive quite well. And this could have implications for um, uh, for designing studies. And when we look at these mutations in these receptors in humans, we should probably be looking for uh, milder or later phenotypes um, rather than looking at uh, maybe just becoming infected with TB or something earlier. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and to allow me to share this project and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks Jean-Yves. Okay, I wonder if uh, either either the judges or anyone uh, listening has a question. Yes, Maz, please go ahead. Um, fantastic, Jean, if I I really enjoyed the talk. It's, it was very nice, well done. And I'm wondering, just as you mentioned, you know, when you have knockout mice that targeting the TNF or some other key important uh, signaling like interferon gamma and so on and so forth, you have very quick uh, phenotype at the very early stage of the infection. But in this type of the model system that you use, it seems like the phenotype is at the very late stage. So uh, I'm wondering if you have any thought on potentially contribution of adaptive immunity in this whole process, because your phenotype is really at late stage. So I'm thinking this may indicate that, you know, some of the component of adaptive immunity might be more important in this uh, signaling path phase that you study rather than innate. So that's why you have this dichotomy between, you know, the phenotype at the earlier stage versus the late stage. So any thought on that? Well, we know from some other work and also from some of your work, even that in, when these receptors are missing, we definitely have at least a delay in mounting of the adaptive immune response. So in the absence of these pattern recognition receptors, you will have either diff, uh, less T cells or at least a delay in the number of T cells and their ability to produce effectors when they get into the lung. Um, so like, uh, well, I have some data that shows 
that uh, at three weeks, whereas wild type mice have so many T cells in, that reach into the lung tissue to provide protection, uh, we don't get the same number of T cells with the knockout mice until six weeks. So there's at least a delay in the adaptive immune response. Um, whether or not this is, uh, I mean, I, I would say that there's also, a, because it's so late, this actually argues that there might be also a, a role for the innate immune response as well, because the adaptive immune, the difference in the adaptive immune response seems to manifest early. So if there is no adaptive immunity, mice will die quite quickly. Whereas the, the, since the mice are dying so late, it seems like there's something maybe that's smaller, but more that could that over time results in uh, mortality in these mice, rather than a switch of adaptive immunity, which comes on in three or four weeks. Thanks, Randy. Thank you. Um, so as always, the questions are flooding in, but uh, er, um, I'm just, you know, we really just have time for one more question. Erwin has a quick question, I hope, and Jean-Yves a quick answer because already we're over time. Okay. Okay, Jean-Yves, I just want to, um, like Mars, congratulate you. It was a very nice presentation. So very, very quick question. Why do these mice die? Do they die for the same reason or do they die for different reasons? So we've done histopathology on the lungs of all of these mice and it looks like they die of pulmonary TB. The lesions look quite similar. I'm, I'm, we're still in the process of quantifying them, but they still, it, they begin with weight loss. They, they become less active. And then when at a certain point we euthanize them compassionately because they're clearly on the way to dying and in the lungs, they look like they have similar pathology. So yeah, there's, we don't see any over differences so far. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Jean-Yves. Great, great presentation indeed. Um, okay, next is, uh, is Sarah, Sarah Danchuk, role of SIG-K regulon in infection outcome in MTB complex subspecies. Nargis can you you're up next, just as a warning. Okay, go ahead, Sarah. Cool. Um, is that good for everyone? Yes? Yes. Cool. Uh, you could, yes, better. Cool. Um, so Marcel will let you know that there's been a bit of a subversion of your expectations. I'm actually going to be talking instead about redefining zoonoses and asking as the field, what have we actually missed? So a little bit of background here is that the WHO defines zoonotic TB or ZTB as human infection caused specifically by M. bovis, um, which is the, bovine, or the main cause of bovine tuberculosis in Western livestock. However, when members of our own TB center, so Duffy et al. went to India, they screened 940 samples. And what they found was none of the zoonotic TB they were detecting was actually caused by M. bovis. Instead, it was caused by something known as M. orgis. Oh, it's not working. There we go. Um, M. orgis is a unique member of Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex subspecies, or MTBCs, and it was first characterized as a separate strain in 2012 by Van Ingen. Its host range remains unknown, though it has been isolated from humans, cattle, monkey, oryx, etc., and it is suggested to be endemic to South Asia and South Asian livestock. As I mentioned, ZTB is defined as infection from M. bovis, which means that the contribution by M. orgis is underestimated because no one's looking for it. This leads to an often a misidentification of M. bovis or M. africanum, and as such remains largely unstudied, which is a great opportunity for my thesis in our lab. <laughs> so the first thing we wanted to do was actually establish an experimental model um, using the aerosol route and wild type background. And this was important to us as to our knowledge, this is the first time this has been done in our field at all. No one's put M. orgis into a mouse and saw the outcome. We also wanted to determine the virulence factors using gene disruption and gene complementation. And finally, we wanted to explore host contributions to pathogenesis. So was it similar to MTB? Is this an M. orgis specific process or even a zoonotic specific process that's occurring? So the plan was to infect with 200 to 300 bacteria. And as you'll notice, this is a bit higher than what Jean-Yves showed you. So this is a high, medium to high dose. We then wanted to determine bacterial burden at weeks three, six, and 12, which is common when we use a chronic TB model. But instead what happened was that week four, we actually had 50% of my M. orgis group succumb and had to convert this to a survival model. Expecting the same rates of mortality, we thought that within the few weeks, we would have reached endpoint for all of our animals and we could finish the experiment. However, we only saw one other animal death at week seven in the MTB group. 
which means that we had no further documented mortality until our experimental endpoint at week 17, surprisingly. So we wanted to dive in and say what was happening in the lung. So we decided to look at the bacterial burden and between MTB and m just at week three, we see that our m just wild type group actually has about four times the bacterial burden in the lungs. So we said, okay, this is before mortality begins. What happens when I'm seeing 50% of my group succumb? And interestingly, we actually see a reduction in bacterial burden in the lung between week three and week four. So we then wanted to show, or we then wanted to look at the difference in the histopathology outcomes of these lungs. So what I'm showing you here is lungs at week three for an M tuberculosis infection and week th three for an M orgs infection. What we can say is despite there being four times bacterial load, it looks like there's still healthy airspace as shown by the lighter portions here. So that's healthy, healthier lung tissue, as well as areas of consolidation, which is these portions here. However, they look relatively similar. So we said, is this the same trend at week four? The answer is no. <laughs> so what we can see here is that at week four, there's almost an entire consolidation of the lungs with very little healthy tissue remaining. So between week three and week four, there are drastic differences between what's occurring histopathology, histopathologically in the lungs. Now I said we wanted to establish an infection model and this means that we do in fact have to repeat it independently. So we asked, you know, was this something about the way that this was infecting? Was there something about the aerosol stock, the dose? And the answer was no. So at day 24 or 20, 28, I had four mice reach their endpoint. And at day 29, I had another mouse reach its endpoint. So at the time of this presentation, we have a nearly identical survival curve with median time about 28.5 days. And to make sure we can re recapitulate the results of bacterial burden and histopathology, we also took the lung, spleen, liver, and kidney for either determining bacterial burden or seeing the histopath to make sure the results were similar and again, not just an outlier. Which leads me to my main question for you as a group, which is what is happening between day 21 and day 28 that's resulting in such significant mortality? Or contrary wise, for the mice that survived, how did they do it? What did they overcome to allow them to have an endpoint 13 weeks after 50% had died? So this really results in a few implications and further directions. So with M. Orgis, we now have an experimental infection model we can exploit and use in the lab for downstream studies which means given the high bacterial burden, we could use this to test drugs. We can see if a treatment truly does work to reduce the load of bacteria. Similarly, we can talk about, but since we know the high mortality that's continually occurring at day 28, we can evaluate the efficacy of vaccines. So if you vaccinate mice and you challenge with them or just, can you move mortality? Can you reduce it or does it go further? So we can check to see if vaccines are effective. And finally, this is kind of the part that you did touch on. For my thesis, I want to determine the virulence phenotype. And so I'm looking at targeted mutations for one putative virulence factor known as MPT70 and the regulator that controls it known as the SIGK regulon. And with that, I will take any of your questions and hopefully some of the answers you want to give me. Okay, thanks very much, that's great. I'm sure there's questions. Everyone's okay. still recovering from the change of topic, of course. I sprung board off of Jean-Yves because as you can tell, there's a very different um, survival curve between 280 and 28 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Michael, did, did you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. Um, so thanks, Sarah. So you've repeated your experiment two times. You've kind of seen, seen the same thing. Both experiments were with this high inoculum level. So the inoculum was the same, but it was the high dose of at day one. We had 200 to 300 bacteria that actually established the infection. But yes, they were both the same level. Okay. And have you thought about doing this again with like a more regular inoculum, like 10 to 50? To yeah. See. So we're actually doing a dosing experiment soon. The reason why we aimed so high in the first place is because we just didn't know if M. orgis could actually establish an infection. So usually with zoonotic TB, we see presentations that are extra pulmonary. And so because no one had put any of the bacteria or any M. orgis in the lung, we had no idea what our starting point was. So we figured it was better to go higher and make sure we had an infection established than go lower and not see anything. But yes, we're looking into doing uh, much lower doses. So I, I had an accident once where I gave too many bacteria with 2B and yeah, the mice all died within 30 days, but mm -hmm. from a, a 
you know, pneumonia type thing, I think. And mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's something to keep in mind that you don't want to go too yeah. long. Well, that's why we also made sure that it was the same with MTV. So everything was given at that standard dose to make sure that there was not like MTV got 50 and that's why it survived. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a quick question, Dick? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. Sarah, this is really fascinating, really cool stuff. I really enjoy, I know that you're gonna dig in more and find more information, but this is really, really awesome. Um, so my question is, uh, Sarah, have you looked at the dissemination of the bacteria to other organs? Like, do you see more in the spleen or any other uh, organ? No. I actually do. I have it here. Okay. Um, so what we wanted to look at was, in, so I usually take the spleen, liver, and kidneys. Uh, kidneys because there's a theory or there's an idea when it comes to transmission where M. Suricati can actually transmit it through the urine. So we're wondering, could that be something similar with other zoonotic infections? But I don't have any of my kidney data uh, put up here. But what I do want to show is that for the spleen, we see that it actually has an increased splenic burden in the MTB group and an increased M or just uh, burden in the liver. And that wasn't as surprising because usually with zoonotic infections, you do see increased liver pathology, at least from the literature that I've read. Mm -hmm. And at week four, very similarly, where in lung and spleen, we see a reduction. Um, this one is not significant and neither is this for the liver, but there is, it looks like a decrease in um, the spleen itself, the, the load there. So your prediction is, so this really indicate maybe this is all about dysregulated immune response that causing yeah. massive immunopathology in the lung and, 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 and that's basically, I think that's what you guys are thinking. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's really interesting and what's striking is that, you know, for bacterial burden, we see that it's different between week three and week four, but like seeing how consolidated those lungs were at week four, like there's gotta be something about what cells are coming in, what immune response is being uh, mounted. And I kind of think of, you know, when you're an undergrad, they teach you that if you have too much of a response with immunology, like that's what kills off the host. So I'm curious as in this case, you know, are we stimulating the wrong cells or are we bringing in things too strongly that the host just can't contain and ends up leading to its death through a pneumonia type pathway? Um, Cause as we can see, it is very much dying of a pulmonary phenotype. Um, rather than any dissemination that we're seeing. Yeah. That's fascinating. Thank you very mm. much. Okay, thanks, Sarah. So uh, we're, we're out of time once again. Thank you very much. That's great. So Nargis Khan is next. I'll try to read your title quickly. Um, so MTB reprograms uh, hematopoietic stem cells in type 1 interferon gamma dependent manner to impair trained immunity against TB. And just a warning, Shannon Duffy, you're up next. Go ahead, Nargis, please. Okay, said the just give me a second. I know what's that. I'm sorry for that. I don't know. Something is wrong. Okay, do you want to switch, Shannon? I see you're there. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I will figure it out meanwhile. Shannon, would you be able to go ahead? Are you all right? Yeah, I don't mind. Okay. So Nargis, you have 10 minutes to... Okay. 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 Great. Shannon, thanks. Go ahead. No worries. Let me just share my screen. Okay, everyone can see my slides? I can, anyway. Okay. Okay, so hi, I'm Shannon Duffy. I'm another student in Marcel Baer's lab. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you guys about a project of mine, developing a multiplex real-time PCR assay for BCG and its validation in a clinical laboratory. So as some of you guys might be familiar, I've presented this to the TB Center in the past and Sarah briefly introduced, uh, introduced this for me. Um, so. I have done other research with zoonotic TB, and we published this study this past year where we were looking at zoonotic TB at Christian Medical College, or CMC, in Valor. And we had screened 940 uh, clinical samples from patients with suspected TB, 
And we identified seven cases of zoonotic TB caused by M. origis, and we didn't identify any cases uh, caused by M. bovis. We did, however, identify five cases of BCG. So as everyone here, I'm sure is aware, BCG is a live attenuated vaccine that's widely administered for protection against tuberculosis. However, BCG is associated with a very rare but life-threatening complication of disseminated BCG or BCGosis. Um, and this is most likely to occur in people with underlying immune conditions. So what I learned while I was at CMC was that BCG detect detection wasn't routinely done in India um, and at CMC. And um, in India, there are two strains, BCG Russia and BCG Danish. BCG Russia is an early strain, meaning it was obtained from the Pasteur Institute before 1931, and BCG Danish, which is a late strain, meaning it was obtained after 1931. And it has been suggested in the past that there are potentially higher rates of adverse events in early strains, but this has never been formally investigated. Um, so it was really interesting to learn, you know, the assays that I brought over to look for zoonotic TB were actually really helpful in this regard to confirm these cases of BCG uh, or disseminated BCG. So it's important to diagnose a case of disseminated BCG because the clinical management for a patient with disseminated BCG disease is going to differ from that of someone with mycobacterium tuberculosis. And because there are two different strains of BCG used in India, this provides an opportunity for pharmacological surveillance if we're able to determine whether an early or a late strain is causing a case of disseminated BCG. So lab differentiation of mycobacterial isolates is essential for a diagnosis. And like I said, this is important because the clinical management is going to differ. And what I mean by that is that People who develop uh, disseminated BCG likely have an underlying immune condition, such as a primary immunodeficiency, like severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID, or an HIV infection. BCG is also resistant to parazinamide, so this is also going to affect uh, the drugs that that patient is being put on. So the current diagnostics that do exist for detection of BCG rely on culture and detecting large deletions called regions of difference or RDs by conventional PCR. So reliance on culture is time consuming with mycobacteria um, and using conventional PCR is not always a pragmatic option for a really busy clinical lab. And some of the research that I had done with zoonotic TB at CMC had suggested that deletion typing using RDs is not always a reliable option for differentiating between mycobacteria. So given that, we, did, we aim to develop a two-step real-time PCR assay to rapidly identify BCG, which could be implemented into the lab at CMC. So real-time PCR has some advantages. You can target multiple genes at the same time. Um, it doesn't rely on a gel, so it's a little bit faster and easier. Um, and what we wanted to do was design the assays to differentiate by single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs rather than deletions. We also wanted to make sure that the assays we designed could be used to detect BCG directly from culture or from clinical samples. So there's no reliance on culture. So this is how the first step of the assay works. So the first step is designed, I want to differentiate BCG from other types of mycobacteria. So it's a three probe multiplex PCR. It targets the insertion element IS-1081 and then a SNP in KDPD and pink A. So this is also providing some important information because the SNP in pink A is what is associated with parasitamide resistance. So BCG would be positive for our, all three of these probes. So I'm just showing an example of BCG Russia. So a positive result looks like a nice curve like I'm showing here. Bovis would be positive for IS-1081 and for pink A. So there's two positives here. And then any other member of the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex or MTBC would be positive for just IS-1081. Um, so I'm just showing an example of what M tuberculosis would look like. And then something that's not a member of the complex, that's a non-tuberculous mycobacteria, isn't going to be positive for any of these probes. So this is just an example of what a negative result looks like if I use m abscessus DNA. So the second step of my assay is used to differentiate between early and late strains. So there are 14 different strains of BCG uh, separated into early and late strains, just as a reminder in India. Russia and Danish are used. Russia is the early strain and Danish is the late strain. 
Um, and so this is just two probes, one that's targeting a SNP in CRP that's specific to early strains. It's an example of BCG Russia. And one that's targeting a SNP in MMA3, which is specific to late strains. And this could provide some additional information as well, since this SNP is associated with low levels of isoniazid resistance in late strains. So once we had developed and validated these assays, we then sent them over to our collaborators at CMC and Valor, and they tested them on nine clinical samples, seven of which were from cases of suspected BCG. Um, so I'm just showing the two controls that were also included here. So these were from adults and they were correctly identified as MTBC. And of the seven that were suspected to BCG, BBCG, these were all confirmed. Five of them were found to be early strains and two were found to be late strains. So this is very much an ongoing study. This is a pretty small sample size. I just got information for an additional six samples this morning, but it was a little bit late to add it to my presentation. But of those, I had another two BCG strains confirmed and four others were identified as MTBC. So as these continue to come in, we'll be able to evaluate, hopefully in the future with a larger sample size, whether early or late strains might be contributing to more cases. Um, and because there wasn't an assay in the past to be able to confirm these cases of BCG, it's been really great to hear that this has been useful and that at least for some of these samples, they were not able to obtain a culture and they were straight from a clinical sample. So they got to subvert that step. So that was great to hear as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks for jumping in there as well. No um, so, right, any questions? Last time, uh, one of the trainees had a question, but I didn't notice. And uh, um, okay, so Matt is also thanking you for the <laughs> capacity building at Valor where he trained few years ago. Um, any questions? I could ask one, which is simply that I noticed that most of the, the BCG um, that was isolated was really like from lymph nodes or pus, but really in small children, many of them infants. Yeah. So are these really just sort of local complications that people are taking biopsies of, or do you know, are they really systemic or, or disseminated? So these were all, this assay was to be used for ones where they were suspecting them that they had BCG. So they had already assumed that this could be a possibility. And that is most likely to occur in children who are three usually or under um, because they usually have an underlying immune condition. They're vaccinated at birth um, before that condition is recognized. And then this disease develops usually quite shortly afterwards. Um, BCG cases are also suspected if there is a lymph node involvement usually, so that also puts them into this category to be tested in the first place. Okay, thanks. So Erwin, do you want to go ahead? A quick question. Thanks a lot for the very nice presentation. Uh, you know, it's a very high uh, frequency of BC disseminated BCGosis. Do you have any idea why? You mentioned some of them may be primary immunodeficiency, but usually we like to think for pathogen specific immunodeficiency deficiencies in the context of disseminated BCGosis. So what do you know about these patients? Is there anything known that uh, adverse effects of BCG vaccination are very high in that environment? Yeah, I mean, it seemed like quite a high number for me as well, because in the past literature, I would see studies where it's like a 25 year study and they still only have like 40 cases of BCG because it is a pretty rare condition. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. I, like I said, a lot of this is really new information. So I don't have all of the metadata for some of the samples. For some of them, I do know that they were confirmed to be skid patients, um, but potentially it also has to do with HIV infection. Um, that's not something that I have been given the information on, but it's something we'll continue to collect as we get um, more samples and, and this goes on. Are you banking uh, you know, samples from the patients? Sorry? Are you banking samples from the patients? Like um, so this is all going on at CMC, but yeah, all of the DNA that we collect is, is kept. <laughs> thank you. Great. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Great, great presentation. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn back to Nargis. Nargis, are you okay now? You're still muted, but are you ready to go? Nargis, you're muted um, as well. Oh, sorry, sorry. Are you ready to go? 
yeah, I'm just trying to fix it because I have a savior now with me. So I hope I will be able to uh, fix this problem. Okay, so let's skip again to the next speaker. That's uh, actually Mayara. Uh, and then Nargis, hopefully just send me a chat when you're ready, okay? And then okay. I'll, okay. I'll, I can call on you. Okay, Okay. so uh, Mayara is next and maybe Stephanie after that. So Mayara is talking about scaling up an investigation and treatment of household contacts of TB patients in Brazil. Take it away, Mayara. I was here. Yeah. So thank you very much, Dick. Uh, I'm presenting scale up investigation and treatment of household contacts of tuberculosis patients in Brazil, a cost effectiveness and budget impact analysis. I present on behalf of all other authors. So Brazil is one of the 30 uh, high TB burden countries in the world with around 70,000 new TB cases a year. For Brazilian guidelines, all the household contacts should be investigated for active TB and latent TB, meaning all of them should receive a symptom screen and tuberculosis, uh, tuberculin skin test, a chest x-ray if symptoms positive or TST positive. And if active TB is rolled out and TST is positive, the household contact should receive uh, tuberculosis preventive therapy. But what's happening in reality in Brazil is that the priority continues to be screening for active TB. And this is reflected by the national operator, uh, indicator operator from the national TB program. That's the number of households identified and examined for active TB. Indeed, when we did a, a cross-sectional study in 12 city, in 12 uh, clinics from three high uh, TB incidence cities in Brazil, we identified around 700 household contacts and only eight started TBT. Sorry, I'm having trouble to pass. So, uh, so we decided to do a cost effectiveness and a budget impact analysis of the scale up of enhanced TB program, uh, TB household contact program in Brazil that will be screening for active TB and latent TB investigation and further TPT if, uh, if applicable. So we considered three strategies. Uh, the first strategy was this is the status quo. That's what's currently done in Brazil, uh, the current situation. And we compare with two other strategies, the active TB detection that's an enhanced uh, case finding for active TB without LTBI investigation and treatment. And we did a full household content management that's an enhanced active TB with uh, active TB detection plus LTBI investigation and treatment. So for the effectiveness measures, we look for the new uh, number of new active TB patients detected among household contacts in a cohort of 100 indexed TB patients. And we also look at the number of household contacts that complete LTBI treatment in a cohort of 100 index TB patients. So for data source, uh, fortunately the Brazilian NTP uh, does not keep records of the number of household contacts that were diagnosed with active TB, and then the number of household contacts that complete LTBI treatment. Therefore, we need to do a systematic review. So for this strategy one, we included studies uh, conducted in Brazil that were collecting under routine practice, the investigation of household contacts under routine practice. And for strategy two, we included studies that use interventions to increase active TB case in finding only. And for strategy three, the full household content management, we included studies that use interventions to increase active TB and LTBI investigation and treatment. And we did a random effect, uh, random effect analysis, a random effect model to do the meta-analysis. So this is, looks complicated, but it's just a simple cascade of care of LTBI. So everything in black, it's uh, just enhanced active TB detection and everything in gray, it's the full household, uh, full, uh, household contact management uh, for LTBI. So here, for example, the household contacts identify, they receive a symptom screen, those that have a symptoms positive go for med evaluation and then if they receive a diagnosis, treated for active TB, otherwise they are uh, discharged. While in the uh, enhanced LTBI management, the household contacts go for LTBI screening, those that have symptoms or TST positive needs to have a med evaluation or they receive an active TB uh, diagnosis or they need to start TPT and complete TPT. And then we, uh, the meta-analysis we did like the the, the proportions of each person completing each step of the cascade. 
For cost, we're looking from a health system perspective and we cost each activity performed in each step of the cascade of care. We have very detailed information costs in Brazil. And for the cost effectiveness, we did two ICERs. The first ICER is the incremental cost associated with the necessary activities per additional activity be, uh, detected among household contexts. And the second ICER, we did the incremental cost for the steps only related to the enhanced LTVI activities per additional household contact completing CPT. And later, finally, we did a budget impact analysis. So using the number of pulmonary TB patients diagnosed in Brazil in 2019, we estimated the number of household contacts expected. We expected uh, three household contacts per index case in Brazil. Then we estimated the number of household contacts completed each step of the cascade, either in the status quo or in the two enhanced strategies. And we used the meta-analysis to estimate the proportion nationally. And then we estimate the number of TB cases avoided among the household contacts completing TPT. And later we estimate uh, the proportion, proportion of the MTP budget that would be used in the status quo or, and in the enhanced strategies. So very quickly, uh, this is the cascade of care. So here we have uh, in the status quo, for example, in a cohort of 100 index TB patients, 200 uh, contacts will be identified no contact will be diagnosed with active TB and only three with completed LTBI treatment. While in the enhanced cascade, 300 household contacts would uh, be identified, 14 would be, uh, uh, 14 would be a, a diagnosis of active TB and 71 would uh, complete LTBI treatment. And in the cost effectiveness analysis would cost around $300 for, per additional active TB patient detected in the enhanced strategies compared to the status quo and around $159 uh, uh, for completing LTBI treatment compared to the status quo. And looking from the Brazilian, if we scale up nationally using the full cohort of uh, pulmonary TB patients in Brazil, we had it in 2019, uh, 64,000 pulmonary TB patients. And if you go and walk, walk through the status quo, 118 uh, contacts would be diagnosed with uh, active TB. We would avoid 132 uh, 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 cases among the household contacts. And for 118 diagnosis cases, we would use 4% of the national TB budget. And to avoid 132 cases, we would use 5% of the national TB budget. While in the household, uh, the haste cascade, we would diagnose 9,000 active TB cases among the household contact. Then uh, we would avoid 4,000 uh, pulmonary TB cases in the, in the household contact. And for diagnosis 9,000 active TB cases, we would use 9% 9, 9 of the the national TB budget and for avoiding 4,000 uh, uh, TB cases in the household context, we would use 12% of the national TB budget. So in the conclusions, like, uh, sorry, I apologize. Uh, for the conclusions, one third of the cost to be used to identify one active TB patient. Uh, so to get the contacts go through the cascade and to diagnose as active TB would cost $160. Then we need another $300 to make the household contacts complete in LTBI treatment. Would cost Brazil every year four million and a half to avert 4,000 cases. That seems a lot, uh, monetarily say. But if this 4,000 patient uh, contacts develop active TB, would cost exactly the same four million dollars. Uh, zero costs when you're comparing treating active TB and treating at latent TB. Uh, and so therefore we think it's a good strategy to scale up active TB and latent TB investigation in Brazil. Thank you. And I'm sorry for the technical issues. Great, thanks Mayara. So uh, Marcel has a question quickly. Thank you Mayara for the question. If I understand the decision tree before active TB was symptom screening and if you look to countries like South Africa, about half of people with active TB are asymptomatic. Do you think that symptom screening should be the first step? Or do you think we should consider doing something like x-ray screening to find the people who have active TB but don't have symptoms? 
Uh, I think for the the WHO guidelines in uh, the WHO guidelines in the for if you are not HIV person and if you're not if you are using even HIV and using ART, the symptom screens has a good sensitivity for active TB. So that can be the first step, and then we do the chest X-ray later. Thank you. Great, Jonathan. Question number two. I knew it. Yep. Hi, Jonathan. Yep, just quickly. Uh, yeah. From our good presentation. Um, Thank you. The one question was when you're considering the cost of active TB of the like that final slide. Was that just a, about a thousand dollars in Brazil to treat someone with active TB? Was that the estimate that I'm seeing? Yeah. Or does that was, consider other things as well, like downstream? It was the, the actually was the, there was the report done by you and uh, Dr. Kevin Schwartzman. Uh, they considered a thousand and something dollars to treat active TB for the target profile that you did for South Africa, Brazil, and it was right. around, yeah. Okay, so it's just the treatment of active TB and not the just, downstream cost. Just the treatment which, for active TB, yes. And we did not consider, consider that. Yeah. No, and we, we should. And we also did not consider, for example, uh, uh, transmission modeling, how many cases we are avo avoiding transmission if we treat it for latent TB, for example. Okay, thank you. I'm out of time. Text messaging me. You give me 15 seconds. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, great. Thank you, Mayara. Terrific. Great presentation. Um, I know basically everybody's speaking at lightning speed in order to uh, meet the tight timelines. Uh, okay, so next we have Nargis, who uh, has solved her technical issues, I hope. So Nargis, give it a whirl. Yes, good. There you go. Nargis, take it away. Nargis, you have to unmute yourself as well. Oh, sorry, okay. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the reprogramming of hematopoietic stem cells by MTB and its impact on trade immunity. So as we all know that tuberculosis is a leading killer in facial disease and it killed 1.4 million people from TB in 2019. Though we have the BCG, the most widely administered vaccine against TB, and it's highly protective in children, but do not show protection in adult. And indeed we have put a lot of our efforts in improving our current BCG vaccine or designing new vaccines, but our ultimate goal was to focus on T cell mediated immunity. Indeed, T cells are important in TB, but there's no direct evidence available to support that T cells control the infection. In fact, uh, this raises the concerns that are we really uh, targeting the right immune compartment for, for targeting our vaccine? In fact, there's a data shows that the new vaccines targeting T cell mediated immunity didn't show any protection either in animal model of TB or in the clinical trial. I've listed here two of the clinical trial in 2015 with MBA85A vaccine, and another is subunit vaccine H4IC31, which actually boosts the T cell mediated response, but didn't show any superiority in terms of protection over BCG ray vaccination. So if not the T cells, then what next? So there is epidemiological data suggesting that innate immunity control the MTB infection. So some of the individuals living in hyperendemic area of TB or the close contact of uh, active TB patients who are at high risk of developing active TB are TST negative, but acquire the natural resistance to TB infection, suggesting that uh, most likely these individuals have highly efficient innate compartment that control the MTB infection even before the T cells get exposed to the, to the antigen. And this sounds great for, for, for vaccine, but does innate immunity have memory-like capacity? So there are evidence from plant or invertebrate suggesting that they do lack adaptive immunity, but, uh, but provide protection against subsequent reinfection. Even the humans exposed to, to the vaccines provide protection against non-specific infectious diseases. The, in line of these evidence, it is very, uh, 
has been established now that innate immune cells upon exposure to the pathogen or to the microbial ligand undergo epigenetic reprogramming and these cells acquire a better effective function to control the uh, uh, infection. And this whole concept is defined as trained innate immunity. But the short-term lifespan of innate immune cells uh, limit their potential to harness them vaccines. And in fact, this can be overcome by targeting the hematopoietic stem cells. These are the long-lived cells, have maximum self-renewal capacity, and when there's a demand of the immune cells, these cells give rise to the myeloid progenitors, which promote myelopoiesis, or give rise to the lymphoid progenitors, SCLP, that promote lymphopoiesis. And the top three population here are collectively termed as LKS population. And we explored this area and demonstrated that excess of BCG in the bone marrow reprogram these stem cells. These stem cells undergo epigenetic modification or transcriptional modification, and the signatures get transmitted downstream to the progenitors up to the monocytes. And these monocytes get trained and become more efficient in controlling the infection. And this whole process is type 2 interferon dependent. So having this novel concept that stem cells get reprogrammed and generate train immunity, our question is, what about MTB and its impact on HSCs and its train immunity? So to address this part, we used a similar approach as we had in our previous published study. So uh, just to have a side-by-side -side comparison of BCG vaccination or MTB infection. So we have one group infected with MTB IV or BCG vaccinated with BCG IV, and we look for the uh, phenotyping in their bone marrow for LKS, myeloid progenitors, or for the lymphoid progenitors. And what we observed here that mice from the vaccinate, BCG vaccinated group or MTB infected group showed a similar level of LKS expansion by day 28. However, the MTB infected mice showed significantly higher expansion of LKS at day seven, unlike BCG vaccinated mice. And I would like to mention here that we don't have data for day 90 because the mice from MTB infection started dying after day 45. So we have not included this uh, time point here for analysis. When we look for the downstream of these LKS, we observed that the MTB infected mice showed a significant decline in their uh, number in CMPs and which are pretty consistent till day 28 post MTB infection. However, the BCG vaccinated mice showed a decline in the CMP number, but these numbers get recovered by day 28, and we have pretty much similar uh, number at day 90, similar to the baseline. Unlike to the CMP, when we look for the lymphoid progenitors, MTB infected mice have higher number of CLP compared to the BCG vaccinated mice. So this data suggests that MTB suppress myelopoiesis and promote lymphopoiesis. With that, we want to uh, be, be uh, went for the transcriptomic profile of HSCs after BCG IV vaccination or MTB infection, and we look for the bulk RNAC. And what we observe here that there are some of the pathways which are um, I'm listing. Uh, we have listed here. They have the genes highly enriched in their magnitude, either in response to the MTB, as I'm highlighting here, type one interferon pathway, or some of the genes highly enriched in their magnitude towards the BCG. So the top one is heme metabolism. So having this unique uh, distinct phenotyping from BCG vaccination or MTB infection, now we want to look for the functional data. So we have the similar approach, mice were vaccinated with BCG or infected with MTB. After four weeks, we treated them with the TB drugs, rested them for two weeks as a washout period, and then we drive the bone marrow dried macrophages from their bone marrow cells, infected them with MTB in vitro, and we look for their protective capacity. And what we observe here, the macrophages derived from the BCG vaccinated mice conferred better protection against MTB infection. However, the macrophages derived from the MTB infected mice are more permissive to the MTB growth. So this data suggests that this BCG reprogramming and MTB pre-programming are completely different. And, but the question is, what is responsible for their different differential reprogramming of these their, their HSCs after BCG vaccination or MTB infection? So we know that in our, our bulk RNA-seq data, we have type 1 interferon signature imprinted in response to the MTB. And also we know that type 1 interferon is detrimental to the, in the host immunity to TB. So keeping that in our mind, we uh, infected our wild type and if not knockout mice with MTB and look for their survival. So if not knockout mice do not have type 1 interferon signaling. And we observed that they have, are highly resistant to the TB compared to the wild type mice. 
And also these mice have better recovery of myeloid progenitors at day 28 post MTB infection compared to the wild type mice. When we look for their functional data, so the macrophages derived from the IFNA knockout mice, irrespective they are infected or not infected, there's no difference in their protective capacity. Unlike the macrophages derived from the MTB infected mice uh, from the wild type, they are more permissive to the MTB growth. So I'm just going to summarize here that the excess of BCG in the bone marrow reprogram these stem cells, train monocytes and macrophages, and these macrophages are better protective in, against MTB. And this whole process is type two interferon dependent. However, the excess of MTB in the bone marrow suppressed myelopoiesis, and this, this is regulated by RIPK3 and, type, and iron pathway, and the macrophages derived from these myeloid progenitors are more permissive to the MTB growth, and this whole process is type 1 interferon dependent. And thank you. I'm happy to take the questions now. Great, Nargis. Thank you. Um, don't, don't turn on mute. Um, I wonder if anybody has questions. Either trainee, Mar so Alok, do you want to read your question? Hi, uh, my name is Alok. Uh, I'm not from a, a TV center there. I'm calling from a JHU TV center and I have the privilege to attend the meetings and I hope I will not be <laughs> uh, having this opportunity further. But uh, my question to you, uh, Nargis, very nice presentation. Uh, so did you see any difference uh, in the metabolic reprogramming of these bone marrow derived macrophages? Uh, so we haven't assessed the functionality of the macrophages after uh, in this particular study, but we are working on that side that either, because this is one of the feature for the trained immunity, and there might be some differences in the reprogramming of the macrophages derived from the BCG or MTP, but we have not assessed that part yet. And my second question is that, Despite of the fact that train immunity is a, a program of uh, myeloid cells, but we have concerns related to its uh, transmissibility or its durability of the response. But isn't it true that uh, the T cell populations that use uh, or anyone should be investigating, particularly T regs, will they have a differential response with respect to BCG and MTB? Uh, I think PCG and MTB, it's reported that they, there is differential response in the, in the regulatory T cells, but particularly in our model, when we have the IV vaccination, we have not assessed the T cell part in particularly in our study. So with the systemic approach, there are differences in the T-reg population or particularly in the T cell population. Uh, we have no idea about that. And my last question, why did you opt to do sorry, IV but, vaccination? Uh, sorry, Alec. Thanks. Thanks for your questions, but we, we are actually out of okay, time. Sorry. Rush. This is like a hopelessly jammed schedule here. Uh, thank you. So thank you, Nargis, and uh, for your excellent presentation. We'll pass to the last presentation. Um, so kind of representing the, the, the full spectrum of research here. So Stephanie Law is going to talk about a, um, a qualitative evaluation of a TB screening campaign in a northern Nunavik village. And hopefully, uh, good. You have you're able to successfully share your screen. So this is the last of the oral presentations, and hopefully the judges are all busy scoring, etc. Great, take it away, Stephanie. All right, just to make sure everybody can see my screen and hear me. I can hear you, and I can see your screen. You could put your screen in presentation mode as well. Good. All right. So I titled this presentation, We Need an Inuk Who Knows About TB. It's a quote straight from the evaluation. Um, I'm obviously presenting this on behalf of my co-authors, and I'm currently a postdoc for FAS. A bit of background, um, as you heard earlier from many, the ITK released the Inuit TB Elimination Framework in December 2018 with two main goals across Inuit Nunungat. First is to reduce the TB incidence rate by 50% by 2025, and second to eliminate TB by 2030. Following that, the Nunavik, region, the Nunavik Regional Board of Health and Social Services released the Nunavik Regional Action Plan Against TB, which identified six priority communities for TB screening, which you also heard about earlier. Um, 
So the objective of this evaluation was to qualitatively evaluate the acceptability, feasibility, and implementation of one of these screening campaigns in one of the villages. Uh, specifically, we wanted to know what people thought about the TB screening campaign, what people thought about their screening and treatment experiences, and how the TB screening campaign could be improved. All of this was requested and re approved by the uh, Nunavik Regional Board as part of quality improvement for screening campaigns. Briefly about this particular screening campaign, it happened in late fall, early winter of 2019, and it took place over 10 weeks. The campaign targeted all residents aged two or more. Um, there were two places in which the campaign took place. Uh, first, the skin tests were performed at the youth house, which many had mentioned earlier was renovated specifically for this campaign. And then uh, the x-rays and the clinical follow-up were done at the nursing station, which was at the top of the village versus the youth house, which was in the village center next to where people would do their shopping for groceries and whatnot. In total, 830 people were screened during this campaign, making up 92.7% of the eligible population for this particular campaign. So the methods of this evaluation, we recruited a convenience slash purposive sample of TB, TB providers, so the nurses and doctors, screening campaign staff, which includes the nurses who um, come up from the south to the north to work on the campaign, the local workers, so people from the community who worked on a campaign, and the planning staff who organized the campaign. Uh, and then we had the community leaders, including the mayor, uh, uh, staff who worked for the mayor, the elders, um, screening participants, as well as refusers of the screening. We conducted focus groups, interviews, and field observations over a period of one week, and then we thematically analyzed all of that to look for emergent themes. So in total over the week, uh, there were 35 interviews conducted, or rather we interviewed 35 people, um, and half of it was the was TB or campaign staff, so local workers, TB doctors, screening nurses, and half of that was from the community, um, including people who participate in screening and also two who refuse to uh, participate. So for the results, um, I'll be presenting the main themes or some of the main themes and then their uh, representative quotes according to three broad aspects of the campaign. First is the implementation of the campaign, second engagement with the community, and third retention in the screening and treatment cascade. So for implementation, um, as many had also mentioned earlier, the location chosen for the screening site for the skin test in particular was very well accepted because of the location. Um, so this youth screening participant said, a lot of people are like, I'm lazy to go to the clinic. I don't want to be with sick people or don't want to be seen. So it's better to be at the village center. Um, local workers said they would like more training before the start of the campaign. So this worker said, we have to keep going back and forth to get answers to the people when they ask questions. Hopefully next time train more prof professionally, like one week training workshop before the campaign. So I should mention that um, because of timing and scheduling, the local workers were trained the same day that the campaign started. So for engagement, there was very good participation and outreach via the community elders over the FM radio. Um, so this community leader said, we as a group of elders talked about the campaign on the FM this morning. And since then the people were calling and they seemed to support us. People felt very responsible to get tested in order to protect others. So this person uh, said, I do it because I'm asked to do it, the testing, but I don't know the entire reason behind this. I want it to be treated and not infect others. So I do it for the community and do it for the ones I love. This person actually got uh, tested positive for latent TB. Uh, finally, parental and peer pressure really helped encourage the younger participants to come. So this youth said, I had pressure from both of my parents, friends, and elders to come get tested. I wouldn't have come if my friend didn't make me. I just wanted to go with him. So for retention, um, it was mentioned that an educated and trained local worker could really improve provider-patient communication. So this local worker said, we need an inlook who knows about TB and is trained and comfortable with it. And that's the quote that I took for the title. Um, 
community elders want to help build trust towards testing and treatment, really particularly about those who are more hesitant or refuse to participate in the screening. So there's elders that they don't want to come to the nursing station or social, social service, so I could go to them instead. That's the only way they will come to us. That's what we do to get them to trust us. We have to let them trust us first. Finally, more education and support during TB treatment, uh, including latent TB treatment is needed. So this person said, I should have done my latent TB treatment better. I was supposed to be treated in nine months, but it took me almost two years because of alcohol. I didn't want to take the pills when I drank. I should have done better. So this person uh, later tested, uh, tested positive for active TB during this campaign. So in conclusion, interviewers were satisfied with the campaign and found it both acceptable and feasible. There was a very strong sense of social responsibility and the associated pressures, uh, social pressure, peer pressure, parental pressure, and it all seemed to be an important motivating factor for participation. <laughs> Engaging local leaders throughout the campaign was very important for continued engagement from the community, particularly for those who are harder to reach. Um, training local workers earlier and more comprehensively could help them take on more responsibilities before, during, and after campaign, and all of this could help with engagement and support um, uh, and then that follows by saying that by training them, we could then provide Inuit-led TB education and support during the entire process, including the treatment uh, after testing positive. So I'd like to thank the support of everybody at the Nunavik, board, Nunavik Regional Board who helped me support the local workers in the village, everybody who participated in the evaluation, and like to mention that the sharing of this evaluation was approved by the Villages Health and Wellness Committee. Thank you, and I could take your questions if there is time. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Stephanie. Yes, there is time, a little bit of time. Marcel has put his hand up already, so go ahead, Marcel. Hi, Stephanie. A nice presentation. Could you clarify, were there different interviewers as well? And if so, do you get different answers depend on who asks the question? No, there was one interviewer, but uh, sometimes the interviews were, con were conducted in Inuktitut through an uh, interpreter. So in those cases where there is an interpreter, it definitely could be different because of anything lost in translation, but, but it was one interviewer. Thank you. Great. Anyone else? Okay, clock's ticking. I, I have a quick one. Yeah, yeah, I can have, just ask a quick question. Steph, that was a nice presentation and really great to see such sort of positive results coming out of an uh, interesting study that you've done. I'm just wondering how much opportunity you have to share those results with other Inuit communities and how relevant they are, sort of how representative this is and if there's lessons learned that can be shared with others. Yeah, uh, so I have presented this on multiple occasions to the, obviously the, the people at the Nunavik Regional Board and then also at the ITK. And we have also brought it back to the community that this was done in to, to speak with the wellness committee there and share these results with them and see what they thought about it. Um, and in general, I think people are very, they feel good about what happened and they feel good about this evaluation and feel good that it's on paper, knowing like how we can move forward and how we can improve in the future, not just in this community, but doing this kind of work in the other neighboring um, villages in Nunavik. Yeah, great. No, I think it ties in nicely also with Minnie's talk at the beginning where again, the, a different community, but even higher participation rate I don't know whether that that screening that she quoted with 97% that came from after uh, that ex your experience that you're quoting or came before. But anyway, obviously, uh, must be a lot of community engagement to get these uh, participation rates so high. All right, thanks again, Stephanie. Okay, and once again, we're out of time. Um, okay, so um, that's the thing with these Zoom conferences. There's really like no normal break where you can get up and chat and whatnot. Um, so we're going to move on to our uh, third kind of keynote talk. I just briefly ask the judges of this uh, to email the form. I guess you could send it through chat, but uh, not to me, please, as I wouldn't know what, uh, how to download it, uh, to, uh, to Danielle and or Lysandra, uh, either email or send it via chat to them um, privately, perhaps if you send it via chat. Uh, your score so that at the end, after Robin uh, talks, 
I can, uh, as part of the sort of closing remarks, announce the winners. Great, okay, so next, uh, Robin's peered on the screen. Uh, just give me a moment, Robin. So, um, so Robin uh, Christine Waite is the Policy and Advocacy Manager at Results Canada. Um, this is a not-for-profit organization uh, generating political will to end poverty. She's also the Secretariat for the Stop TB Canada Network. So uh, kind of two organizations in one here, uh, trying to reinvigorate and mobilize Canadians to ending TB at home and abroad. So uh, Robin, we're very pleased to have you uh, here today and tell us a little bit about what Results Canada and Stop TB Canada is doing and perhaps how we as a group can also help those efforts. So I'll, I'll pass, pass the baton to you. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to, to be with you all here today. So my name's Robin. I already had a great intro, so I won't dive into more about myself. But I'm really here today to convince you, if you're not already doing so, as well as equip you to take advocacy action to end tuberculosis. So Zoom calls were super Zoomed out, I know, it's draining. Um, but if you feel comfortable doing so, please do turn on your camera. We're going to try and make this session a little bit more engaging than other sessions that we've had. And first thing I want you to do is take a minute, get up from your desk, go grab two sheets of paper and a pen, please. So find in your area two sheets of paper and a pen. I'll give you a second. And while you do that, I'm gonna stretch because we should do that. I do this in front of my team sometimes. Just stretch on calls because it's really good to get some body movement in. All right. Awesome. Two sheets, two sheets of paper. So I'm going to, if you're okay with it, I'm going to call on people throughout this session. And if I call your name and you're not comfortable speaking, that's okay. You can just say pass in the chat, not say anything. And I'll go to the next person and hope that they, they are willing to speak up. Okay. So first I want to know from you, um, what do you think advocacy means? And I just want one person to respond to my question. What do you think advocacy means? And I'm going around the room and I am going to call on Marera. That's me. Uh, so uh, what advocacy means for me, it's fighting for the right to the others they cannot fight. Okay, and I want to hear from someone in the room um, a, a story, a short story about how they've maybe taken advocacy actions sometime recently. Um, I'm going to call on Joel. Um, thanks, Robin. So recent advocacy was yesterday when we had the Results Canada webinar. Um, I did tweet out uh, a message tagging Justin Trudeau and all of them to increase their contribution for uh, for TB. Great. Thank you, Joel. Much appreciated for everybody who's speaking up. Um, so Results Canada, we are well practice at equipping and mobilizing advocates. And for us, what we think advocacy means or how we think about it is it's, it's really about taking action to influence decision makers and bring about change. Change in the world that we wanna see. Okay, so I wanna do a little bit of an exercise with everybody so that we can witness some advocacy in action. So everybody should have two sheets of paper. With your first sheet of paper, I want you to draw a line down the middle of your page and then I'll like lay it lengthwise down and then also across like, like that, okay? In your top left bucket, I want you to write the word who at the top. In the right bucket, I want you to write the word what at the top. In your bottom left bucket, I want you to write the word when at the top. And in your bottom right bucket, I want you to write the word where in the top, okay? So 
we are going to watch a short four minute video, an inspiring video, I think it always moves me. And I want this to be an active watching exercise. So watch the video. And as you're watching, try to fill in what you see in the video, who's participating, what's happening, what different activities and actions are taking place that you see, when is it happening, and, and where might these things be happening. Prioritize your top two buckets because that's where you're probably gonna get the most information downloaded to you through the video. You'll, the, the bottom two, less important to try and fill in, but you should pick up on a few things, okay? So I'm going to share my screen. And it's always a risk to share my screen, but here we go anyways. I don't know, this one. And um, I know Alex and Lena are in the room. If for some reason this video isn't working so well, can you please just WhatsApp me so I'm aware because I'm not gonna be looking at my chat here. Okay, so everybody active listening mode, fill in your piece of paper, let's go. You are named the face keeper. When you are named the face keeper of the Onondaga Council of Chiefs, and for me, it was 51 years ago, you are told that we are now placing in your hands all life. And it is your responsibility to look after all life. Every person, every tree, every animal, every stream, and the earth itself unto the seventh generation. In 1972, the world started a process that is mapping our future. The United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held in Stockholm brought the industrialized and developing nations together to delineate the rights of people to a healthy and productive environment. The environmental crisis with profoundly altered our planet. Fossil fuels is slowly warming the globe. Our report is founded upon the concept of sustainable development. We all have two hands and the sentiment of the world. Now I wonder if they will even exist. We are plundering our children's heritage for our present unsustainable practices. That time is the key is to come out from Johanna's work with a credible commitment to action. Now is your moment to save ourselves and the planet for our children. We can fix this. We can stop this madness. Celebrating climate change is your right Our link arms, the doors marching for climate action. We baby are going to fight. Mommy, daddy, your president too. We will all fight. We are experiencing a process that is making our nations and communities much more closely together than they have ever been before. Our lives are intertwined via the food we eat, the music we listen to, the information we get, and the ideas we hold. Last year, the world's leaders unanimously committed to eliminate extreme poverty address climate change, and build more resilient societies. In the Agenda 2030, we have a blueprint for sustainable development. Now the real work and the real opportunities begin. The potential offered by these new sustainable development goals and the binding treaty on climate change is immense. It is a new chapter of hope for the world. It is we, the peoples, who are embarking today on a journey towards a more sustainable and equitable future. Our journey will involve governments, the United Nations system, and other international institutions, local authorities, indigenous peoples, civil society, business and the private sector, the scientific and the academic community, and all people. Because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. This interconnectedness among humans on the planet is creating a global village where the barriers of national and international boundaries become less relevant and the world a smaller place. The road ahead may be fraught with difficulties, challenges, and struggles, but we must dare each other to be visionary, to be ambitious, to be leaders. Given the opportunity, we can raise ourselves. We must join hands with the rest of creation 
and speak of common sense, responsibility, solidarity, and peace. We have all the tools. We are standing in front of an opportunity to change the course of life on the planet. Let's work together to make this world better where everybody can live with dignity and abundance. Our future starts now. To leave no one behind, we must all lead. To leave no one behind, we must all lead. And we all have the power to take action. So this, this video has a purpose. It's this quick overview of what advocacy looks like in practice. And I'm gonna call on a few of you again to kind of read out what you put in the different buckets. Um, so I'm going to call on Lynn. Lynn, can I call on you? Can you read out a little bit of what you put in the bucket of who? Who did you see represented in this video? Nope. Okay. What about Marcel? Are you there? Were you actively listening? Yeah, I saw just about everybody. I saw representations of young and old and the, the what it used to call the United Colors of Benetton when Benetton was on every street corner. All right. Great summary. Okay. Now to the what bucket. Um, Erwin, you're unmuted, I see. Do you, can you tell me what you might have seen happen in the what bucket, anything that you put down? Yes, I saw climate change and sustainability mm -hmm. and Agenda 2030. Mm -hmm. That's it. All right. Um, and what about, I'll, I'll add a bit to that. So I also saw things like conferences and summits happening. I saw marches and stunts. I saw science and innovation, references to reports, academia. Um, I saw like policy being made. So lots in the what bucket too. Okay, anything on when? Um, can I call on um, Sharon Mannix to talk a little bit about what you saw in relation to when? All right, moving on, Lysandra. Oh no, Mike. <laughs> okay, Petra, when? I'll name it, whichever UN resolution that we've had starting in 1972 was about uh, flying over the screen. So um, I think it's referencing back way longer, of course, but uh, it's basically focusing on the 2030 targets and all the actions that have been taken in the last little while with different dates, if you want me to mention them. Okay, great. Good summary. And last one, the bucket of where. Um, I'm going to try and call on Jonathan. Right, sorry. I also have somebody in a meeting behind me. Um, so where, I mean, kind of like myself, everywhere. I, I saw pretty much every place on earth represented. And I mean, honestly, my geography is very bad. I can't pinpoint exact locations for you. But it felt like literally every place I could imagine was shown on that video. And exactly, that's exactly the point. So the key takeaways really from this, this, this video about how change happens is twofold for me. It's one, change is iterative and the fight for justice will and must never end. This is an ongoing battle. There's always a risk of progress regressing and there's always a need for more progress. So it's continuous. Next. It takes diversity of voices and actions to move the needle on causes that we care about. So all of you in this room, you're all academics, you're all researchers. Some of you might be policy analysts, project officers working in TV. And that work is really important. It's a really critical piece of the puzzle for how we end tuberculosis. 
we as, as individuals, we also have um, power beyond our day-to-day -day jobs though. So we can also take the extra step and go the extra mile by taking citizen um, action. Creating a buzz and, and raising awareness around tuberculosis, tuberculosis is really what is critical for creating an environment within which political will will exist. And political will is really all about getting those political leaders and decision makers to take action on the causes we care about. And they'll only do that if people are putting pressure on them to do so. And so on this point of, of diversity of voices and actions being really critical to moving the needle, uh, I'm here today because I want to invite you all to join the Stop TB Canada movement. So we are a network of Canadians committed to ending TB at home and abroad. And we are really in a rebuilding and reinvigorating the network um, mode right now. Um, and it will take all of us uniting to fight together ending TB. They don't say those, those terms and slogans for, for no reason. It's because it really does take a village and a community or coalition to, to move the needle on causes. So we're inviting you all today to start participating in the Stop Speak Canada Network if you're not already doing so. Um, so what have we been doing so far? Um, last year, we were really in the laying down the foundations phase. Uh, Stop TV Canada had gone a little bit sleepy, mainly because there was no resource behind um, supporting the network. We have that now, thanks to, in part, the McGill TV Centre. Um, Alex and Lena, who are colleagues of yours, have been working alongside myself and others to, to put in the work to, to reinvigorate the community. Petra is on our steering committee, which is really exciting as well. Um, so we've now got a steering committee. We, this World TV Day, um, sent letters to the Minister of Health, Patty Hadju, demanding up-to-date TV data in Canada. Uh, we also sent a letter to Minister Karina Gould, asking particularly right now for Canada to maintain its investment in TV reach, which its funding is sunsetting this March, and it would be very devastating for us to see a retrenchment of Canada's leadership right now. So we have secured a meeting with the minister's office. I think we've had like six or seven meetings with MPs. We've got more monuments than ever lit up this year for World TV Day. We've got a flurry of media happening, and we want all of you to come on board and, and join our efforts. And there's a few ways that you can do so. Um, so I think in the chat box, Lena might be sharing some links right now. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter, which is the best way to know what's happening and to, to get engaged with the work we're doing. You can also follow us on Twitter, another great way to know what we're doing. Um, and you can join our directory. So step one is kind of mapping who's doing what in the Canadian context so that we can connect one another and we can tap into your knowledge and expertise as and when makes strategic advocacy sense. So we want to reach out to you for speaking opportunities. We want to amplify your work. So we need to know what you're doing so that we can, we can help you kind of take your research and put it into practice. So um, we're here to do that. We'd love to have you join our movement and uh, hope to see you soon. That is all from me. Remember that never doubt a small group of thoughtful, thoughtful committed citizens can change the world is indeed it's the only thing that ever has. And that's a quote from Margaret Mead. Over and out. Robin. Okay, great. Th thanks. Thanks, Robin. Really terrific. Uh, very nice. Lots of, lots of uh, things to, to connect and click on in the chat box. Um, and uh, yeah, very nice, uh, very nice video. I was definitely, I was writing things down madly for the first 30 seconds and then I thought, oh my God, this is like, I'm writing everything down as Marcel said, everything, everywhere, every, uh, so very, very effective. Um, I'm so sorry, I forgot to use the second piece of paper. Uh, which was just gonna be for everybody to write on their piece of paper, hashtag NTB and then to show it on screen for us to take a screenshot and then post it on social. But that's only if we have time. So I'll leave it to you with discretion. Um, I, we probably have time. Madhu, maybe you can coordinate this. I'm behind the scenes trying desperately to get organized for the last part, which is announcing winners and various things. We're still having a little trouble scoring things. So Madhu, can you just uh, kind of do this? Sure, sure. So all of you, if you can write NTB on a paper and hold it up like the way I'm holding up 
um, my uh, NTB sign, then Robin will take a screenshot and then she will tweet it from Stop TV and our TV center will amplify that. Yes, exactly right. Make sure your face is also visible, not just the paper, right? And uh, yes, if all of you can turn on the videos, then I think we'll not have blank spaces in the in the film. Robin, you have you have what you need? Yeah. Okay, right. everyone, signs up, smile, shirts up, pins up, going. Okay, yeah, I think that's great. Back to you, Dick. <gasps> oh my gosh, I messed it up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> one more. Maybe Lee, you could do one too in case I, you know. Yeah, sorry. I'll take one too, back up. Okay. Hello. Okay, I'm sure we got All some right. backup. Okay, great. Thanks again. Okay, good. So that's great. Um, okay, now, um, forgive me if I'm a little disorganized for like flying around. There's a lot of emails going behind the scenes trying to get the everything organized. So it's four o'clock, so we're officially over and probably people have other Zoom calls to attend immediately as is usually the custom. So I, I just wanted to announce the winners. First of all, there's publication awards. As I said, we had publications from 2019 and winners were selected. Uh, so I'm gonna read those out first and then the publication awards for 2020, which is kind of what we would normally announce at this meeting. So first of all, we have the Margaret Becklake. So Margot Becklake was the uh, founder really of the respiratory epidemiology unit long ago and an outstanding epidemiologist, but also someone who uh, initiated major training programs for uh, research trainees from low and middle income countries and always had um, a coterie of trainees from low and middle income countries, many of whom stayed in her apartment or in her house and so on. So uh, Margot so the Margaret Becklake Prize for Best Paper in Health Outcomes Research by a graduate student goes to Emily McLean. I only have the, the citation, not the title of the paper, sorry, Emily, but for Emily from 2019 in J. Clinton Micro. Round of applause, great. So keep the applause going. So Margaret Becklake, Becklake Prize for Best Paper in Health Outcomes Research by a postdoc fellow goes to Jonathan for a publication that, uh, in Lancet Infectious Diseases. Then we have the Emil Scamini Prize for Best Paper in Biomedical Research. Goes to Lisa Ronald for U European Respiratory Journal. Um, and Jonathan Meekins Prize for Best Paper in Clinical Research goes to Z.E. Lam, Tom, otherwise known as Tommy or something in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Okay, so that was for 2020. Now, turning to this year. So again, um, Margaret Becklake Prize Best Paper in Health Outcomes Research. So we have two winners. One goes to Mayara uh, for something published in the Annals and the other goes to Sophie who, Sorry, Hudart. Sorry, Sophie, if I mispronounce your name. BM, published in BMJ Global Health. And forgive me, I know that normally we spend time, people come up and it's announced and we take pictures and so on, but again, this is Zoom. Turning to biomedical, Emil Scamini Prize for best papers in biomedical research. So Nargis Khan is, uh, we have two winners again, Nargis Khan for her publication in Cell in October, 2020. And uh, Shannon Duffy, uh, related to what she spoke about in Lancet Microbe, uh, also in 2020. 
And then Jonathan Meekins Prize, again, two winners, best papers in clinical research. One goes to Madeline Nash for deep learning. Oh, sorry, I'm not reading the titles again. So uh, in scientific reports and the other to Sarah Danchuk, um, publication in Clin Micro Infections. Clin Micro Infections. Um, great, so those are all for the publications. I'm hoping I have one set of final scores that I received and then I can update that Michael Reed uh, just sent his scores. So I'm waiting for the final, final scores. Okay, so we have again uh, prizes one in biomedical. This goes to Jean-Yves Dubé for his presentation. Congratulations, Jean-Yves. Uh, for uh, clinical research, Sarah Banchuk, congratulations. And in health outcomes, Stephanie Law for her presentation in the Nunavik. Great, okay, so a round of applause for all those winners. Um, the checks are in the mail, so to speak, um, and the certificates, et cetera. There actually are uh, modest cash prizes for all of these awards, so for those of you who won, truly the check will be in the mail uh, or in your direct deposit or whatever is the right research institute method as we now have. And that actually concludes the program uh, for today. Again, thanks to our speakers. Thanks to all the students who presented, to the six of you. Excellent, excellent presentations. Really an, an amazing breadth of research as well as uh, the topics themselves. Um, thanks to the judges who pitched in to provide their scores in rapid fire sequence. And to the people who ask questions, of course, Thanks to Lysandra and Lysandra too, AKA Danielle, uh, for uh, a lot of behind the scenes organization, including really until one minute ago, uh, for pulling this together. And really thanks to all of you for listening, for participating um, and for being on this Zoom conference. And I truly hope we will see you all live and in color uh, next year in the, uh, RI Auditorium uh, post COVID, but in the year of expanded TB research as we take advantage of COVID lessons. And again, with that, I'll say uh, goodbye to anybody unless anyone else would like to say one last closing word. Thank you, Dick. Great, Great job, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Minnie. It was great. Great talk. Nice to see you. Thank you, Danielle. Very good job. Very good. That worked well. Okay. I'm out too. Ciao.